Welcome back to the Stronger by Science podcast. I'm your host, Greg Knuckles, and today I'm joined by a guest co-host, Dr. Pack. Pack, how's it going? It's going great. Um, huge honor to be finally on the Stronger by Science podcast. Long time listener and big fan. I assure you the honor is probably not all mine, but mostly mine. So I I figure uh, a lot of people listening to this already know who you are. Um, And for the people who don't, we'll do a formal introduction once we get into the meat of the episode. Um, But for now, what's on your mind? Do you have any media recommendations, shout outs, or other happy thoughts to get the good vibes rolling? Uh, shout out to my mother, the original Dr. Andrew Lackey, for coming back from her trip to South Korea, where she educated the masses there on everything education related. You know how uh, parents are with their kids, where they semi know what they're doing, but they don't know 100% what they do. Mm-hmm. It's the same with myself and my mother. I know that she educates other educators. Um, and that she has a PhD in linguistics and she just came back from a big trip. So shout out to her. That is awesome. Uh, congrats to your mom. Thank you. Um, for me, uh, my, my little happy thought to get things rolling is uh, I recently made maybe the best scones of my life a couple days ago. Uh, they were some brown sugar and eggnog scones. Uh, it's, it's December, so that is eggnog season. Um, so if you would also like to make brown sugar eggnog scones, um, I'll, I'll post the base recipe that I used uh, in the show notes. It's from a website called Sally's Baking Addiction. And I'll just warn you, if you try to follow this recipe, it's actually not a particularly good recipe. Um, I don't know why I continue using it because like it will it will be way too wet. Like if you just follow it verbatim, like scone dough is supposed to be reasonably dry compared to most other doughs. So like, yeah, it's not a great recipe, but like the first time I used it, I just figured out how to modify it for my needs, which is basically just adding more flour until the the consistency seems right. So anyway, if you want to to follow this, uh, just be forewarned, you will need to add more flour. But yeah, basically, I just used that recipe as as the base, subbed in brown sugar in place of sugar. Um, The recipe calls for cream or buttermilk. And since they're brown sugar eggnog scones, obviously I used eggnog in place of the cream. Uh, And then seasoning wise, I just used freshly grated nutmeg and tonka beans, which uh, fun fact about tonka beans. Pac, do you you know what they are and are they legal in the UK? I do not and uh, I'm not sure. (laughs) So I'll I'll circle around on on tonka beans again in a second. Um, But yeah, so... Spice-wise, just freshly grated nutmeg and tonka beans. Um, And I added some little miniature dark chocolate chips as well. Um, Not a ton, like not the full cup to cup and a half of mix-ins the recipe calls for, like maybe half a cup or so. Uh, Just add a little bit of bitterness to cut through the sweetness. And uh, they were very, very good. So if if you're listening and you want a holiday-appropriate scone recipe to uh, enjoy this season, uh, I'd recommend giving that a shot. Have you pulled up info on tonka beans yet? Yep. So from the BBC, um, an article titled, The Flavor That Is Illegal. Selling tonka beans to eat has been illegal in the US, apparently, since 1954. But uh, in the UK, I think they're fine to use. Okay, cool, cool. That's what I thought. I think think the US is one of the few countries where they're illegal, but... um, yeah, they're they're really good if you're if you're into baking. Like they're particularly good in sweets. They also pair well with seafood, but they have kind of like a vanilla esque flavor. But I'd say just kind of like a bit more complex. Like if you've had like fresh vanilla beans, it's kind of like the vanilla flavor you expect from like a vanilla extract. But it's it's like it has kind of higher, more floral notes. I would say tonka bean. Kind of the base flavor is very reminiscent of vanilla, but then it's kind of like deeper and warmer. So it's just kind of like it's a vanilla esque flavor, but like with a different inflection on it. And um, yeah, they they are illegal in the U.S. for just like weird regulatory reasons. So there is, and I'm blanking on the name of it, but there's a chemical compound in them that is a blood thinner, mm-hmm. and 
essentially like any any food that wasn't a part of the U.S. food supply prior to 1954, I think you said it was from the article. Um, yeah, anything with that chemical that wasn't part of the U.S. food supply in 1954 is just like blanket banned. Because, um, you know, it, it thins your blood. It could have like negative drug-drug interactions, could cause bleeding problems, theoretically. But like, there's not enough of it in tonka bean to actually be dangerous. And in fact... Um, like if, if you've ever heard that there's a compound in cinnamon that thins your blood, it's the exact same thing. And there's like a way higher concentration in cinnamon. Uh, but cinnamon was already in the U.S. food supply in 1954. So it got grandfathered in <laughs> and tonka beans are still illegal. So I had to find a supplier in France that was willing to ship to the U.S. Um, but yeah, if you're willing to jump through some regulatory loopholes in the U.S. or... I would assume just go to your local supermarket, basically anywhere else in the world. Um, check out tonka beans if you haven't already. They're uh, they're they're a very fun ingredient to bake with, especially for sweets. And they are legal in the UK, so I can get them off Amazon. There's plenty of different products and varieties or whatever dosages I can get. But on the scone topic, it's uh, such a coincidence that you're on the hype train as well. In my household. Both sweet and um, savory scones have been a major hit the past few weeks with me consuming up to four scones per day, either with jam and, and butter or with soup. And I wanted to get your opinion on soups. Are soups a bit underrated? I felt like they can be like a nutritional powerhouse um, that people often sleep on, especially more like creamy soups that taste really nice. Oh, yeah. I, I think soups are unbelievably underrated. They're, they're very flexible. Like you, you can make just about any kind of soup. And I, I think people who have a narrow view of soups just need to expand their soup horizon because you can make hot soups. You can make cold soups. Um, the, just about any cuisine you might like, there are soups in that cuisine. So they could be kind of bland, just like a standard like chicken broth with some veggies in it. Or it could be extremely flavorful because like what is a thinner curry except for a soup i mean i can't see how that wouldn't meet the definition of a soup but yeah man they're they're excellent particularly for cutting um like if you're trying to lose weight i think they're super clutch a misconception people have is that liquid calories are inherently non-filling because like a lot of energy dense liquids are non-filling, uh, particularly things you would drink like sodas or whatnot, uh, a lot of alcoholic beverages as well. But the research on method of consuming liquids is very interesting. So there was a study a while back um, that compared, I think there were three conditions. I know there were at least two. Yeah, yeah, I, I think there were three. I think it was drinking apple juice, versus eating an apple with like an equivalent amount of calories versus uh, eating apple juice with a spoon as one would consume soup. And the most satiating of the three was eating apple juice with a spoon. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, like... That's interesting. Most like energy-containing beverages, it seems like part of the reason that they're not particularly satiating is just that you can consume them so quickly. Um but something that does have a pretty big impact on satiety after a meal is just like eating speed. Um, so like the longer it takes you to consume a particular amount of energy, the like to, to a point, the more satiating it tends to be. And like soups can be really delicious and not particularly energy dense. Um, Cause I mean, they, they are mostly water. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, they, they slow you down. Like, a, a big old bowl of like you know chicken rice like even if you're not adding a bunch of added fats or whatnot might still be like seven eight hundred calories like an equivalent volume of soup might only be like three or four hundred and it's not going to be that much less satiating especially if you do eat most of it with a with a spoon and you know like like slurp down the the little bit of broth left at the end but like not just uh kind of make all of the mix-ins in the soup really small just so you just put it in a bowl and chug it um but yeah they're they're really flexible flavor wise and i think like really really good for uh when your calories are low and, and you're trying to stay satiated very slept on yeah 
pro tip, try to eat it with a, with a fork, and then you're going to be spending hours and hours trying to eat that soup. That that must make things even better for when you're cutting. So I realize you're, you're verbally shit posting now, but uh, the implement you eat with, there is also fun research on that. Um, like eating <laughs> with a spoon or fork versus chopsticks. Like even if you consume the same amount, kind of kind of on the same tip, like you just can't eat as fast with chopsticks as you can a fork. Um, and so there's not like a huge body of research on this, but the studies that have been done comparing eating with a fork versus chopsticks, eating the same amount, it's just more satiating to eat with chopsticks, probably not due to anything about chopsticks per se, but they just like slow you down so much. It's a similar concept, but I think I think eating soup with a fork might slow you down a little bit too much. But who knows? That's that's another topic for another day. That was the most productive uh, shit posting I've ever done because I came out not just having a laugh and enjoying the joke, but also learning a couple of things. So hey, hey, hey. Uh, okay, let's let's push ahead. One little note that I want to make is that the next episode of the podcast will be with Milo Wolf. Um, so if you're listening and you have any questions for Milo, uh, email them to podcast at strongerbyscience.com. I've also posted some threads in the Facebook group and subreddit soliciting questions for both Pac and Milo. So let's, uh, quickly transition into the plugs and then we will dive into the content for this episode. So if you enjoy the show. Please like, rate, and subscribe, and tell all your friends. It really helps us out. Uh, listen on Spotify. Rate us five stars on Spotify. Listen on iTunes. Rate us five stars on iTunes. Say something nice along with your review if you want to. Uh, or if you don't like the show, that's also fine. If you're going to leave a low review, though, at least like say something funny about it. Uh, that is always appreciated. If you're interested in hiring a virtual coach to help you with your training and or nutrition, Stronger by Science has an excellent team of coaches that can help you out. You can learn more at strongerbyscience.com slash coaching. Uh, and in fact, the uh, co-host of this episode, Dr. Pack, is one of our excellent coaches. Um, so if you like what you hear from this episode, that is that is the level of charisma and expertise that you can expect from Stronger by Science coaches. Um, and if you don't like this episode, the rest are, are better than pack. Uh, <laughs> not actually, but that's what you can tell yourself. Um, if you want to purchase supplements from a reliable source and support the podcast at the same time, reliable and, and cheap source, um, check out bulksupplements.com and use the code SBSPOD at checkout for an additional 5% discount off of their already low prices. Uh, if you're in the market for a premium macro tracking and diet coaching app, uh, you should check out Macro Factor. And uh, I also just wanted to note on that, our label scanning feature recently came out. So uh, if, if you get annoyed when you scan a barcode and nothing comes up because it's not in the database, now the app has a feature where it will automatically pivot from barcode scanner to... Uh, optical character recognition, like using the same camera as it's pulled up, and uh, you just position the nutrition label in front of the camera. It'll pull all the information off of the label. So instead of needing to to manually create a custom food that might take a minute or two, now you can do the whole thing in like 10, 15 seconds from the time the scan starts to actually naming the food and logging it. Super fast, uh, very, very cool. So uh, yeah, check that out. And uh, if you want to learn more about the app, you can go to macrofactorapp.com. Uh, if you would like to stay up to date on the research that is relevant to strength and physique athletes and coaches, check out uh, MASS or Monthly Applications in Strength Sport. Um, you can learn more about that at massresearchreview.com. If you want to stay up to date on all of the goings on in the Stronger by Science extended universe, join our Facebook group and or subreddit. Um, and that's that's a good place to be, because if you would have been in those places and you wanted to uh, ask questions for Pac, the, the guest of this episode, guess what? Q&A threads were posted in the Facebook group and subreddit, and that is uh, how you could have got gotten your questions answered on this show. So if you hear the questions and you're like, damn, I really wish I would have had a chance to ask, eh, join the Facebook group and subreddit. That is that is how you get that opportunity. 
If you want to stay even further up to date, you can subscribe to our newsletter where we send you high quality informative content, not just spamming you with a bunch of ads. You can check that out at strongerbyscience.com slash newsletter. And finally, uh, if you have questions for me or future guests of the podcast or anything else, um, record a uh, one minute max, ideally around 30 second voice clip and email that to podcast at strongerbyscience.com. All right, let's get into it. Um, as I mentioned up top, today I'm joined by Dr. Patroclus Andrelakis Korakakis, or PAC for short. And uh, PAC, my first question for you is, do you also go by PAC to other Greek people, or is that just for Americans and Brits that struggle to sight-read the name of one of the main characters from a foundational piece of Western literature? I do, actually. Most people refer to me as PAC. Maybe my mother and a few family members aside, but uh, since a young age, growing up in hip hop and sort of wanting to have my own tag and essentially looking at how my mother would write my name on like um, clothes and stuff whenever I would go to summer camp so that they know, you know, like pillow pillowcases and stuff. My initials are essentially PAK. So then PAK became my sort of nickname. And when I left Greece at the age of 12, it came in super handy because I went to Germany and having, you know, Germans and even Brits later on try to pronounce my actual name would be quite challenging. I mean, even at uh, university documents, I would often get it misspelled, which would often leave me bamboozled because I was like, aren't you copy pasting the name from somewhere? I'm sure you have some, <laughs> some form of database. How did... And it would be like seriously messed up as well. So I'm like, this person just tried to freestyle it and sort of prove a point versus just hitting control C and control V. Um, you're, you're talking to someone named Knuckles. So I, I definitely feel your pain on that one. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy, especially when it comes uh, from like unofficial documents where you're like, I submitted a form for this. How is it misspelled? Um, but yeah, it's it's also funny because I made a joke about Patroclus being the lover of Achilles and Troy, which is not really a historical fact, but I made that on like another uh, on another video, and there were there were comments by Greeks where they were like, "Hey, that's inaccurate, <laughs> and you shouldn't say it." And I was like, "Bro, chill." I was just joking. <laughs> Look, I mean, uh, not to not to get too far into the Iliad right now, but. Uh, Given the mentorship practices of ancient Greece, I I don't I don't think it's <laughs> crazy to assume that there was some subtext. Not there, that much you know? of a stretch. Um, yeah, there were the Greeks back then. They had certain practices allegedly that would be questionable with to, to, to today's societal standards and what uh, what's acceptable and what's not. Yeah, I'm and and to be clear, I'm not uh, I'm I'm not pandering with uh with some anti-greek racism here which uh man that's a that's a throwback to like the the 1920s um but no i mean yeah it used to be somewhat widespread and in other places much more recently than greece uh you know there were there were some young lads on british navy ships uh all the way up to the early 1900s that uh may have had a somewhat similar experience to young patroclus but Whatever it is, what it is, um, we don't we don't condone that on the Stronger <laughs> by Science podcast, but we also don't turn a blind eye to history. Uh, so, follow up question: There is, uh, if you had to give yourself a Homeric epitaph, what would it be? Like, kind of in the uh, in the vein of like Swift Footed Achilles or Hector Break Breaker of Horses. What is your Homeric epitaph? Oof died for achilles i guess uh bros before <laughs> hectors i don't know well it's it's got to be pack something pack the lover of achilles yeah that works that works uh <laughs> cool i actually i actually had a, a toy bunny that i still have like a when i was a when i was a baby that was uh, nicknamed achilles fun fact fun personal fact first heard on the sps uh, podcast that is uh that is awesome. My my little stuffed animal as a kid, uh, and this is a hundred percent true, uh, was a was a little pink rat that I named Ratty. Um, <laughs> what did you name it? Ratty, R-A-T-T-Y. Uh, I don't know why 
instead of getting me a teddy bear, my parents got me a, a rat, but <laughs> whatever. I, I liked it, you know? Um, my, my brother's stuffed animal was a stuffed football. Uh, we had, we had unconventional stuffed companions in the Knuckles house. <laughs> Let's shift into an actual introduction here, Pac. So, uh, for people who are unfamiliar with you, which honestly, 2023, if people are still unfamiliar with you. That's, uh, that's, that's a them problem, but hopefully we can rectify that here. <laughs> um, so yeah, tell, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Um, kind of your lifting and academic background. What what should people know about you? Sure. So I am, first of all, a lifter and then an academic. I started lifting when I was 16, really got into um, strength training and a, a bit of powerlifting uh, as I reached my 20s. And I just fell in love with the gym and everything that has to do with getting bigger and stronger. Although I never fell in love with either like powerlifting or bodybuilding per se. I just really enjoyed the, the side of lifting and breaking PRs, chasing certain numbers, but not really treating it as a sport, more as a fun hobby and as like my me time where I go to go to the gym, do stuff that I like, feel tired, feel accomplished and uh, leave. As an academic, I've done my bachelor's in uh, sports science, actually in fitness and personal training, which was, which is essentially sports science with some practical modules here at Solon University in the UK. Then um, through my mentor, Dr. James Steele, Steele, associate professor, Dr. James Steele, which uh, I'm sure some of the people listening are aware of, he got me into research uh, from a young age. So around 21 years old, I started doing my first uh, lectures at the university and uh, working on a few research projects, one being um, lower back strength in, in power lifters, via the isolated lumbar extension medics machine. And I published a couple of papers, really enjoyed the side, the research side of things. And then I decided to skip the masters uh, and do a PhD, which ended up being on the minimum effective dose. I've been teaching in and out of uh, universities here in the UK um, for the, the, the best part of the last sort of six years or so. And I'm currently a visiting scholar at Lehman College uh, in the Bronx uh, under the great wing of Dr. Brad Schoenfeld, where we do a bunch of research on all things lifting, mostly hypertrophy and strength focused, and mostly research that uh, directly informs practice and is, as I'd like to call it, research for lifters. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially my goal as an academic. I don't care to, to be in academia and play the game of academia uh, or necessarily make a living directly off research, but I love putting out and, and doing um, research projects that answer questions that interest me as a lifter and can help, you know, at the pack of 2030, uh, figure things out and know what to do better in the gym and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's, that's me in a nutshell. I'm currently chasing a 300 kilo deadlift. Hopefully in the next couple of months, I'll get it. Um, if I don't, hey ho, you know, it is what it is. Where, where's your deadlift at now? I recently hit a 287 and a half deadlift. I think that's 634. Okay, nice. Hell yeah. But that was in jeans and completely unprepared. So that was a random session with poor sleep and I felt like deadlifting and I managed to hit that. So I'm like, okay, maybe start dedicating a bit more time to your deadlift training versus doing the odd single here and there because that's what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I've been doing at the moment. So I was like, okay, let's put a let's put a bit more emphasis on actually deadlifting a bit more so we can get the mighty 300 kilo deadlift, which has been a, you know, all time goal for me personally. Hell yeah. Well, good, good luck on that. You, you mentioned uh, your, your doctoral advisor was James Steele and uh, you're currently working with Brad now. If you could just like hand pick two kind of like mentors in this space, uh, those, those are two, those are two very excellent people to, to work and learn under. Um, so I, I am, uh, I am somewhat envious in that regard, just kind of like sticking with research for a second. Um, do you have any do you have any ongoing projects that you're at liberty to to share anything about? Sure. So we recently published a preprint on optimizing uh, resistance training technique for hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. um, there is a regional hypertrophy 
um, paper that is currently in review, uh, if I am, if I recall correctly, which I, I am recording correctly, it hasn't been uh, pre-printed, but it has been submitted for publication, um, and it's titled "Exercise Selection Differential Differentially Influences Lower Body Regional Muscle uh, Development" by the good. Uh, Ryan Burke et al. So the whole uh, lab from Lehman College uh, is on this, and this was a project that was spearheaded by Ryan, an up-and-coming researcher from um, the lab. So that's that was a, that was a really cool project, essentially looking at the, the leg press, the leg extension, and the seated and standing calf raise. Mm-hmm. There are a few. So there is a meta-analysis that I want to essentially carry out, but as you specifically. No, uh, it's probably a bit of a big project. I want to look at, you know, do a meta-analysis on P-ratio and and hypertrophy specifically. But the inclusion criteria for that would be, would have to be worked out so that we don't look at every sort of uh, study that has looked at body composition changes ever. Mm-hmm. And there, on the back of the narrative review that we did on optimizing muscle hypertrophy, technique for muscle hypertrophy, there will be a study happening in the summer where we want to essentially look at strict versus more lenient technique and how that influences hypertrophy. Mm. There's a lot of terms and conditions there and things that I want to do in order to make a study that has a sound design, but at the same time is ecologically valid and so on and so forth. Um, but that's a project that... Uh, this idea was by Jeff Nippert, actually. He he dropped the idea for both the narrative review and that that study. So the narrative review was done in order to inform the methods of that study. Mm-hmm. And we want to look at things like, hey, does external momentum um, affect, let's say, bicep growth uh, versus keeping things super strict and trying to minimize that external momentum? Because believe it or not, aside from a modeling paper that exists where a person tried to actually see if external momentum would negatively affect uh, adaptations, uh, there's nothing out there. So my personal hunch is that as long as you're working um, very close to failure, I don't don't see how things would differ that severely. I'm not sure what your take on that uh, is. Hmm. So with the... With the study itself, I would be interested in the design, um, mostly with an eye towards like generalizability, because like I do wonder if the type of exercise would be would be relevant. Because mm-hmm. like typically, typically you're using some sort of like cheating or momentum to to get the weight going, and not all exercises have like identical strength curves um you know like some are hardest at the start of the concentric some are hardest at the end of the concentric and so you know like like bouncing off your chest in the bench press a little bit not not just like fully using your chest as a trampoline but like getting a little bounce versus a pause like that feels to me like that would kind of fall under that umbrella um but that would sort of help give you that would sort of help give you a more kind of even strength curve since bench does tend to be harder at the bottom, easier at the top versus something like, I don't know, side delt raises that are hardest at the top, easiest at the bottom. Like this isn't like a strong prediction, but like I wouldn't be shocked. Like my, my weak prediction would be that um, like bouncing off your chest a little bit in the bench press probably wouldn't negatively impact pec growth, but like, I could see using too much momentum on the delt raise, maybe negatively impacting delt growth. We shall see. Hmm. Yeah. We want to also have one of the first studies to openly share video footage of participants doing the exercises. Oh, nice. Potentially. Um, don't, uh, potentially, I need to see whether the IRB will be cool with that, obviously, by still anonymizing indivi- uh, the individual's identity, and also have maybe experts blindly assess uh, technique or rate it, whether it's strict or lenient, because mm-hmm. I want to have a study that is like ecologically valid, where we're not trying to essentially standardize less strict, uh, more lenient technique, if that makes sense, mm-hmm. because then that somewhat defeats the purpose. Yeah. And but rather use cues and then have people say, okay, do you think that was strict or not? And then have that as sort of uh, our judgment of whether um, technique was actually non-strict or strict. Mm -hmm. Um, Just out of curiosity, like what um, are are you planning on looking at different kind of definitions of strictness of technique? Kind of like 
you know, being uh, a little more forgiving with form versus like using some body English to generate momentum? Or are you just kind of like going one way or the other? The thing is that ideally, and now that you said it as well, I think we will have to do it. A Delphi study where we essentially try to like formally define strict technique or what constitutes strict, or at least an interview and survey study with mm -hmm. a bunch of like experts. So that could be coaches, athletes in strength and physique sports, uh, as well as personal trainers and so on and so forth. I think that would help because at the moment there wasn't, there's not even uh, a formal definition for technique itself mm -hmm. in the literature, uh, which we try to also propose in the narrative review that I mentioned. So ideally if we, sort of managed to formally define what is strict technique and then what's lenient technique and is there a spectrum? What do most people regard as strict and as non-strict? Then that would help. But yeah, involvement of other uh, unwanted or untargeted muscle groups, somebody English, but it, it's a bit tricky. The, the design will take some time to really nail, but that's one of the study that is in the works at least. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, think, I think we'll probably dig into this topic more uh, later on in this episode. Um, but just kind of like one, one kind of like final thought that comes to mind there for me is like a, a, a thought slash like something that I find a little bit amusing, which is that like the idea of strict versus loose technique, I feel like does depend a little bit on the perspective you're coming at it from. Cause like, like body English, for instance, a lot of like technique purists will be like, ah, no, like that's bad, whatever. But in terms of just kind of like letting uh, joint kinematics shift over time, um, like if, if you just dress that up and say like, ah, oh, no, dude, like it's a mechanical drop set. Um, yeah. People, people will then be like, oh, that's uh, totally legitimate. When if they thought you didn't know what you were doing, they'd be like, oh, no, like you're, you're just not being strict. So for, for people listening that don't know what what that is, like. For instance, if you were doing dumbbell flies, you know, you start with your elbows more or less fully extended. And then as your pecs fatigue, um, you could go down and wait like a standard drop set to make flies easier. Or you could just bend your elbows more and bring your hands in closer to your body. So if you just like really wanted to absolutely crush your pecs, you could take something that you like take a load that you could do 10, 15 strict reps with with your arms pretty fully extended for flies. And as you can't complete reps with your arms fully extended anymore, you just like gradually bring the dumbbells in closer to your body until you're basically just doing dumbbell press. If if you started with the dumbbell press and called it flies, people would be, people would be like, nah, that's like shitty technique for flies. What are you talking about? But then just dress it up and call it a mechanical drop set. And people are like, ooh, that's a that's a, a very fun and uh, intense advanced training technique. So, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Um, That's a very fair point. And it, it just goes to show how deep the the rabbit hole can, can get with techniques specifically. And depending on the circles that you, you look at and the recommendations that you hear, there are people that will really emphasize certain cues and sort of kinematic adjustments and emphasize them in a way that conveys absolute certainty as far as evidence behind those uh, those changes go. And mm -hmm. there are a lot of people out there that do feel that, oh, if I slightly change the way my elbow is pointing in this exercise, this could have significant implications for muscle growth, for the muscle group that I'm trying to target. But behind the curtain of the, the literature is maybe like a like a single post-it note where you're, you'd expect like piles and piles of papers is like a yeah. little post-it note that says, please check back later. You alluded to the the narrative review that, uh, that you pre-printed recently. So um, let's just take like half a step back. Can you tell, mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, well, I'll, I'll link it in the show notes so people can find it, but what's it, what's it called? What were you interested in and what are, what are some of the takeaways there? Yeah, so the paper is called Optimizing Resistance Training Technique to Maximize Muscle Hypertrophy, a narrative review. And it was, again, a, a very, this was a truly collaborative effort because it was a tricky paper to write um, because technique itself, like defining technique and its different components, 
and then looking like at exercise specific kinematics and whether those are part of technique and so on and so forth. That was quite tricky. So shout out to the whole team. Milo, who's going to be on next, Max Coleman, Ryan Burke, Alec Pinero, Jeff Nippert, and the good doctor, Dr. Brad Schoenfeld. Um, we essentially proposed, although there are some definitions in like NSCA books um, and stuff, uh, or n- not formal definitions, but you can at least like infer what a definition of technique is by reading those books. We propose that resistance training exercise technique per- uh, pertains to the controlled execution of bodily movements to ensure an exercise effectively targets specific muscle groups while minimizing the risk of injury. This involves the orchestration of body positioning um, and alignment, as well as range of motion and repetition tempo. So we broke down the narrative review in uh, different components. We looked at the repetition tempo, and although myself personally and this is something I changed my mind on after doing this this review. I was uh, somewhat of a proponent of really focusing on slowing down the eccentric part, uh, the eccentric phase of a, of a repetition, because um, that's something that we hear often, you know, even things like tr- trying to keep the eccentric as long as four plus seconds. But when we look at the literature, the direct evidence really making a strong case for slower uh, eccentrics is just not there. There are... Um, a couple of studies that did show a slight benefit to like f- when, when you looked at four versus two second eccentrics. Um, but overall, there are other papers uh, that do show that a faster eccentric may be better than a slower one with some terms and conditions there. But overall, the data suggests that you can be pretty flexible with repetition tempo as long as your entire repetition is anywhere between two to eight seconds uh, with some eccentric control, essentially not letting the weight free fall, but really milking the eccentric and really focusing on just extending it more than than you feel comfortable doing doesn't seem, at least based on the data that we currently have, it doesn't seem that like that's really the case. Mm-hmm. Um as far as range of motion goes, based on, and I'm not going to dig into the long muscle length uh, literature because I let Milo play his cassette tape on that because he's the, <laughs> the true expert. I mean, it's the same with me and minimum dose. It's essentially like a pre-recorded, like little packs go in my head and they're like, okay, minimum dose. They got the folder, put it in, press the, press play. Um, but based on the current literature, it appears that utilizing a range of motion that allows you to bias long muscle length should be the default approach to exercise technique when trying to maximize hypertrophy. Although, if you were to take out the last part uh, of range of motion where you're working at short muscle lengths, could potentially enhance hypertrophy via different mechanisms. And you and Milo have written an insane article, um, insane in a good way, on the Stronger by Science website, um, which I urge everybody to check out because you dive into all the potential mechanisms and essentially arrive at a similar conclusion where we're like more research on different range of motion configurations is needed to draw stronger conclusions. Um, And at the same time, we don't have literature on long muscle length training, specifically just exclusively on long muscle lengths on every sort of muscle group. So it's... As a takeaway, just make sure if you're trying to maximize hypertrophy to adapt an exercise so that you can bias long muscle lengths and get a really nice stretch. And as far as exercise specific kinematics go, believe it or not, um, there's like one study on alternating like uh, foot positioning and ca- and calf hypertrophy mm-hmm. where they, they actually directly measured uh, calf hypertrophy. But besides that, there's not much uh, aside from EMG data on like um, grip width and bench press and pec activation. And um, there's some stuff on leg press as well, but there's not a whole lot. Yeah, I guess, I guess at some point there, there is a question of what would you consider a technique variation versus like a whole new exercise? Um, Cause like one, one thing that does come to mind is there was that uh, flat binge versus incline paper um, from maybe like three or four years ago, um, which like, yeah, you could say bench press and incline are two completely different exercises, but you could also kind of view them as variations on the same exercise, you know, like uh, that that is, I think, larger differences than just like, are your toes turned in and out doing calf raises? But like, is it that big of a difference? I don't know. Like, ultimately, you're changing the angle of one joint, like now instead of hip internal external rotation, it's uh degree of shoulder flexion. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. 
Yeah, I agree. And that's something that I tell a lot of clients as well, where they, you know, they'll be like, oh, maybe I should be doing more close grip bench pressing versus slightly wider than close grip bench pressing for to develop my triceps or this or that or the other. And although, you know, preference is important. And if you do like performing a, a slight variation more and it feels better all for it, I am of the same opinion that you are probably not looking at huge changes or huge differences as far as muscle hypertrophy goes, assuming that you're also doing other exercise for that muscle group. So as far as exercise specific kinematics go, um, we essentially looked at, you know, the origin of exercises and sort of made exercise technique and sort of uh, explain how, you know, people just logically thought, okay, I want to train my quads. My quads have this role, therefore I'm going to do this action with my body, and this seems to be training my, my legs. It's not like there were a bunch of scientists and said, okay, now in, we, we want to optimize muscle hypertrophy, let's figure out the best exercises to do so. For example, the squat, first of all, started as like a deep knee bend where people would bend their knees but be on their tippy toes, mm -hmm. and then that sort of, that, and that was like back, I think, in 19 in the 1920s or so and then that sort of evolved to what we know now as the squat but surprisingly back in the in the 60s there were some preliminary although methodologically not super sound research that pointed at squats being har deep squats being harmful for your knees so exercise technique back then was adjusted to limit range of motion for squatting and then more research came out and showed that that's not actually the case so then technique guidelines shifted from stopping at parallel to squatting deep um, so yeah, there's, there, there, there are a lot of question marks there. As far as takeaways for exercise specific kinematics, we, we highlighted that take the sort of universal, um, exercise guidelines on, for example, how to perform a bench press and then ad adapt those to the range of motion and tempo recommendations that were made, uh, in the paper, mm -hmm. um, because we, we don't really know if, you know, slightly um, widening your grip on the bench press makes a huge difference for pec and tricep hypertrophy. Lastly, but not leastly, um, there's no direct literature examining the effect of strict versus non-strict uh, repetition technique on hypertrophy. And although you could argue that the involvement of other muscle groups may negatively affect the hypertrophy stimulus imposed on the muscle that you're trying to target, it is currently unclear as whether that's the case. Um, and yeah, that's what we want to essentially look at later. So as far as exercise technique goes, if you're somebody who's trying to absolutely maximize hypertrophy, make sure you're emphasizing long muscle lengths, keep repetition duration anywhere between two to, two to eight seconds with some eccentric control, and then it's volume and intensity of effort that you need to, to pay attention at. So things seem to be um, relatively flexible and you don't need to be an absolute stickler when it comes to like really controlling the eccentric or whatever. Yeah. So I, I, I agree with everything you just said. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if some of the people listening right now are a little surprised and or confused to hear that. Um, mm. cause if you're, you know, if, if you're consuming, uh, information in this space, you you would be very justified in in coming away with the idea that we actually do know a lot more about optimal technique than than what you just described. Um, like I, I can understand why someone would think that, and um, you know, m mentioning that like, hey, we we really do only have one study kind of on on foot position in the calf about like. Uh, is is one exercise like is one exercise variation more effective than another for targeting a particular muscle? Um, you know, if if you spend much time on Instagram or TikTok or YouTube, um, you you would probably come away with the idea that there's there there's way more research than that, and that we know way more about uh, whether some like one exercise variation is more effective than another. So. Would would you mind just like explaining for the listener where that mistaken understanding might might come from? If uh, if someone listening to this did hear what you just said and thought like, no, that's like way too basic. Like we we definitely know more about optimizing technique than that. Yeah. So th there are a lot of um, educators out there who obviously mostly cater to people that want to 
absolutely make every educated bet they can, even if that bet is not like a large amount uh, of whatever. I'm I'm not sure what the, the currency would be uh, and want to do the best in their ability to absolutely maximize hypertrophy. For example, their um, coach Kasim does a, a lot of videos and yeah, workshops on biomechanical adjustments that you can do to exercises that draw on, you know, um, anatomy, applied anatomy and biomechanical principles and are supposed to then better target said muscle group. Um, and there's a lot of content on that, on optimizing exercise technique, because I feel that it allows, it gives people this sort of um, reassurance that you can, you've been missing out on this slight adjustment that will highly potentiate your gains when in reality it it is an educated, somewhat educated bet at best. And I'm all for people trying to optimize and try new things because it can be fun to play around with exercise technique and be like, oh, you know what? It feels much better now that I, I'm, I've am i slightly changed my grip on the lat pull down. I feel my lats more. It feels more enjoyable. I'm still adhering to basic um you know, hypertrophy principles, and I like doing it that way. But I, I think it all stems from our need to, you know, put out more content and geek out over relatively minute details, which is, is what we're doing to a certain extent with other topics as well. But as far as direct literature, if you were to ask anybody, they would provide you with a mechanistic rationale on why it may be the case. But at the same time, there's no actual evidence that those adjustments do make a difference. And I do feel that a lot of people want to sort of make sure, and I get that with with clients as well, they want to make sure that they're doing everything at their disposal to absolutely maximize their time spent in their gym. But there comes a point where doing more is not necessarily you getting more out of it. I'm not sure what a, what would be a good analogy here. Um, fueling your car more than you need to, putting more fuel in. Two two kind of like directions I, I was kind of thinking about with this is um, one, just kind of like what proxy measures are and like how one would go about validating them in the first place um, for, for yeah. like attempting to make uh, informed, informed bets or informed guesses about some of this stuff. Um, and the other is is yeah, kind of kind of what you were getting at along the idea of of like optimization. One of the kind of like mental models I think a lot of people have um, that I think is understandable, but I don't necessarily know how true it is. Um, is is just the idea that like dose like all dose response curves are basically linear. Yeah, um, exactly. Where like, you, you know, it, it very well could be that, for instance, if you compare a standard lat pull down to some like esoteric variation of a lat pull down that like theoretically biases the lats a little bit more, um, it very well could be that in a vacuum that esoteric variation does bias the lats a little bit more. But it could also be that the hypertrophy outcomes of lat training with respect to lat biasing in an exercise are, you know, like pseudo logarithmic rather than linear such that like, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you're 70% biasing the lats, you're getting the same training effect as like 95% biasing the lats. And I feel like oftentimes that's just not considered. It's just kind of like, if you're not doing the maximal thing, um, which, I mean, I feel like there is research that is, like, related to that to some extent. Um, like, some of the, like, squat or leg press versus knee extension research, I think, is relevant there. Because, like, mm -hmm. you know, knee extensions are clearly going to bias the quads way more than, like, any compound lower body exercise, like... Uh, like squats, leg press, clearly going to train your quads very hard. But, uh, you know, there are other things that could be limiters. Like your technique could shift over time to take some of the stress off of the quads. Whereas with knee extensions, there's really there's really no escaping it. Like your quads are the only thing doing anything to do a knee extension. 
And like knee extensions do seem to be more effective for rectus femoris growth, but seems like they're not any more effective than squats or leg press for like growth of the vasti, like your vastus medialis, lateralis, intermedius. Actually, I don't think any of the studies have looked directly at the intermedius, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 one of those things where like I I I think that most of the ideas that people have around like biasing exercise technique would prospectively predict that knee extensions should be a much better exercise for the quads than squats or leg press, but like the research we have doesn't really bear that out, at least for like most yeah. heads of the quads. And so that, that that's what I was kind of getting at with like the dose, like nonlinear dose response curves, like squats or leg press don't like fully bias the quads, hmm. but it seems like they bias them enough, you know? Yeah. And surprisingly, in the study that I that I mentioned that is under review at the moment, leg extensions did indeed um, favor the rectus femoris, uh, but leg press favored uh, the vastus lateralis, um, which was which was interesting. Oh, nice. Yeah, and I think also like in the context of optimization, if you're somebody who, and again, absolutely no shade at people making optimization content and cool we're lifting geeks at the end of the day and there's a lot of people that have fun playing with different grips different adjustments and at the end of the day it's not costing you much to slightly change your grip or whatever and if you if it makes the exercise feel better i'm all for it and all for learning more about you know anatomy and so on and so forth if that's what you enjoy but if you're somebody who's already on the optimization train chances are you're performing you know multiple exercises for uh, all muscle groups that you are training, you're performing enough training volume and you're training pretty hard. Mm -hmm. In that context, if if let's say you were in a scenario where you had to perform one lat exercise for the rest of your life for whatever reason, sure, I get that maybe in that context, some slight changes may make a, a meaningful difference. But if you're already doing you know two different uh, two types of pull downs, different types of rowing, and you're training with a lot of volume and pushing your training pretty hard. I am not very confident that you're looking at many, you know, and meaningful hypertrophy changes in the long term by slightly adjusting your technique here and there. At least, at least based on the current available evidence. Yeah, no, that that makes sense. That makes sense. I think exercise optimization content annoys you less than it annoys me. Uh, honestly, I'm trying to I'm trying to be open minded because this is the Stronger by Science podcast, not the Muscle and Feels um, Milo and I shit posting in the form of a podcast podcast. <laughs> oh no, that that's that's totally fair. That's totally fair. Yeah, like it's it's not it's not that I'm trying to be mean. It's that like I'm a I'm a crusty old bastard, and what what I mean by that is like I care a lot about epistemology and just kind of like consistency of worldview i guess and so here here's my thing if uh if someone just says like oh like i i've never looked at research at all i don't give a shit about it uh and like i train bodybuilders and like uh here's here's some shit i do with them and like this exercise fucking blows up your lats dude like i have no problem with that whatsoever um because like it is it is like epistemically honest. It's not saying like scientifically this is the optimum lat exercise. It's just saying like, here's something I think. I tried it with some folks. Seems like it gets good results. You know, like it's the 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 reason for that belief is clearly stated. It's like I thought this thing, tried it out, seems to be getting good results. Try it for yourself. You know, may mm -hmm. may give you good results too. The thing that gets under my skin is when it is someone who's kind of like presenting themselves as like a sciencey person and presenting their approach as like scientific. Um, and I, I kind of think that if you're doing that, you're like signing yourself up for a worldview that should be informed by scientific epistemology. And, you know, there, there's a process you need to go through to be able to make claims like that in a scientific process. You know, like if, if you're using something as a proxy for longitudinal outcomes, like that that acute measure or like acute uh, uh, thing that you're estimating, there's sh there should be validation studies. You know, like you you should bring some people in, uh, like collect the data, like measure the variables, 
um, and then look to see how strongly associated those acute proxy measures are with the longitudinal outcomes of interest. And then uh, just to make sure you're not kind of like overfitting or over extrapolating from a single subset, like once you've uh, like once, once you have done kind of that first step of validation, you kind of like take the models you develop in that first population, just recruit another population and kind of run them through the same process and see if the results hold up. And if they do, then you can say like, then you can state with more confidence that like, uh, Hey, like we, we have now validated, uh, acute EMG as a valid proxy measure for longitudinal hypertrophy outcomes. So then in the future, if we do see EMG differences between two exercise variations of like this particular magnitude, we can say with some degree of confidence without doing a longitudinal study, this one will probably give you better results than the other one. Um, but without that validation work being done on the front end, I don't, I don't think you should be allowed to do that, you know? And I think you, <laughs> I think you should take more heat if you do. Yeah. When things like that annoy me, that is what annoys me about it. It's not like the claims people are making. It's that they're like couching it in the language of science, but completely eschewing any concept of scientific epistemology. And like that eh, gets under my skin. And I get it. Same here. And we saw that we saw that with even with EMG, for example, uh, more evidence came out in the last year showing that it is indeed not a great predictor of uh, hypertrophy. Um, and at the same time, science is not as sexy as some people want it to be where mm -hmm. you're like, Oh, look, graph. Yeah. We're measuring this. Okay. There, there's the answer. I mean, even we, we just talked about exercise techniques, something that we consider fundamental and we consider like, okay, this is how you perform this exercise where it, it's not really based on much, but yeah, I totally get why it grinds your gears. And I do feel that there are people out there that do get overly confused when they're exposed to so much information out there especially nowadays where you don't need to be like a geek where you have to go in some subreddit or you know some forum and that's where you're exposed to to that sort of information even if you're on instagram or tiktok it's likely that if you're following uh lifters you're gonna come across videos that present technique adjustments as really based in science and for begin if i was a beginner i remember actually when i was a beginner I would look at certain profiles and I'd be like, okay, things seem pretty simple, not easy, but as long as I do one, two, three, and four for a few years, I'll be big and strong. Mm -hmm. And then I would look at other people and I'm like, wait, I need to do seven different modifications to these exercises that I thought I was doing right. And wow, I've been missing out on gains all this time because I didn't do this and this and that. And thankfully... Um, I learned more and I realized that that wasn't the case, but I can totally see the negative side of it as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, I, and to, to be honest, I'm probably a bit more sensitive to that than I probably should be. Um, in, in part, just kind of due to the makeup of our audience. Cause like, as eh, a, a pretty good chunk of people who follow stronger by science are like pretty nerdy and like to get in the weeds about that. And, I think maybe more likely than the average person to uh, experience some degree of like mental distress when they're exposed to content like that. And they're like, oh no, I'm trying to do everything right. And like, now this thing is saying I'm not doing everything right. Ah, what's going on? And like, yep. I don't know, man. Like I, I, I care about the people in the audience and like, it's, it's causing them some degree of mental anguish. And I'm like, ah, no, like this stuff is bad. Like it, it, it pisses me off because it's, it's causing bad vibes for people that I like. Um, You're right. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe the people that I like are more predisposed than average to experience bad vibes when exposed to that content. So, eh, I don't know. Staying on technique for a bit longer, um, I think it might be worth talking about tempo a little bit more. Um, just because, like, I, I think that... Uh, the idea of like really slowing down the eccentric or just doing slow reps period is maybe a little bit less popular now than it used to be. But that that is still an idea you encounter pretty frequently. Um, so is, is that something you'd you'd have interest in just talking 
a little bit more about like what 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 the research says and maybe maybe kind of like why slow tempo like at least like based on uh, w- would you be able would you be willing or able to like speculate on why slow eccentrics don't seem to be that much better for hypertrophy mm, yeah loaded question um we can we can definitely have a look at the at the literature and the current state of evidence because it's not it's not that much of a that much of a deep dive mechanistically i wouldn't feel super comfortable to do a proper deep dive now because i don't think i'm sufficiently prepared um to do that but like if there was a there was a recent uh, review that looked at again 10 point hypertrophy and essentially concluded that so that was that was by wilk et al 2021 that a combination of slower eccentric and faster concentric repetitions seem to be best for maximizing muscle hypertrophy um, however, even the authors of that review were like, look, um, the heterogeneity among the protocols of all the studies reviewed is, is not great. And the, they said, hey, stay anywhere between approximately three to eight seconds per repetition. But if you look closely at the studies they cited for the, in support of slower and faster, slower eccentrics and faster concentrics, they looked at a study by Keeler et al. from 2001, and uh, Noguera et al., um, 2009. And if you then look at those studies, one study was um, essentially comparing a five versus a four-second um, eccentric and while prolonging the duration of the concentric phase. And they found that prolonging the concentric phase did not uh, do much when compared to a faster concentric phase. And they also did not directly measure hypertrophy, but rather changes in lean body mass. Mm. So a bunch of limitations there and not, and not really. So that was cited in support of, hey, perform faster concentrics because uh, the eccentrics were, were pretty much the same. They mm-hmm. looked, they assessed body composition via bot put. So that was one of the, of the limitations. And they also noted that all the participants in that study did not see any significant pre to post changes in lean body mass, uh, specifically stating that any changes in strength uh, and aerobic capacity, because they measured strength and aerobic capacity, were observed in the absence of changes in lean body mass. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be very confident in just using that as as anything more than uh, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they then, uh, in contrast, Noguera et al. demonstrated that a faster concentric of one second resulted in significantly uh, greater biceps uh, and rectus femoris hypertrophy when compared to a slower concentric phase. That was uh, three seconds, but that was also done in a cohort of older men, um, if I'm not mistaken, 70 plus years old. And then there were a couple more studies. One that compared uh, a four second eccentric to a one second eccentric with a one second concentric in both groups in the in the biceps, but the findings of that study by Pereira et al. in 2016, they showed no statistically significant differences in hypertrophy between the two groups, but the effect sizes favored the group that performed the extended, extended eccentric phase. And yeah, there's then there was there were some studies actually that showed that a slower eccentric um, sorry, sorry, a, a slower concentric, so a six-second concentric when compared to a two-second concentric resulted in greater increases in uh, vastus lateralis, lateralis type 1 and uh, 2A fibers, while the second uh, second eccentric group uh, only inc- experienced increases in vastus, later, vastus later, lateralis type 1 fibers. And, and it, like, the literature is not really solid. There's some conflicting data, but yeah, overall... It's, it's just kind of all over the place. All over the place. And that's, like, that's th- there's a couple more studies, but that's pretty much it. Um, so the next time, like, I used to be a proponent, and my apologies to all the individuals that have worked with me who did hear from me to, hey, control the eccentric a bit more. Um, but extending the eccentric more than a couple of seconds doesn't seem to be a game changer as far as hypertrophy goes. There are places for it and there are cases where it feels more comfortable and you're able to get a better stretch and therefore bias long muscle links more. But 
it's uh, it's nothing magical. Why do you think that uh, that may be the case? There was a recent uh, was a recent post by uh, Menno as well, expanding on the topic. I'm not sure if you saw that. Uh, I I didn't. I mean, I'll I'll be honest with you. I am I'm almost entirely off social media these days, which has been very clutch for my mental health. But then sometimes I'll I'll just kind of like peek in and I'll uh, yeah I'll, I'll I'll see things where like I know I'm uh, wading into the middle of a conversation where like I'll 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 see something I'm like oh this is like definitely definitely like a sub post uh, about something else that someone posted days ago that I didn't see. So yeah, uh, now when I get on social media, it is like more confusing than it's ever been. But no, I, if, if you ask me, did you see a particular post? The answer will probably be no. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, I think like the reason that I've heard most frequently for why slower eccentrics um, would be assumed to be better um, is, is just the idea that like eccentrics are more effective for yep. muscle growth than concentrics. And so if you slow down the eccentric, you're going to increase the eccentric stress um, like imposed by the exercise, which I think you're I think you're extending the duration under which you are experiencing eccentric stress but you are to some extent um reducing the intensity of the eccentric stress that you're experiencing mm -hmm. um because like the highest forces um both like externally and like internally in a muscle during the eccentric are at the end of the eccentric when you're like reversing it to start your concentric um, where, you know, the, the bar has a negative velocity and you need to decelerate that to zero and then, you know, start accelerating it upward again, uh, or like bar, whatever implement you're lifting, um, all else being equal. If the bar were moving eccentrically at one meter per second, when you're three centimeters from reducing it or 0.33 meters per second, when you're three centimeters away from reducing it. You're going to need to like to like decelerate the bar to zero meters per second. You're going to have like that that acceleration will need to be three times greater if mm -hmm. the eccentric velocity is faster, like at that point in the lift. And so, yeah, with the slow eccentrics, like the 0 0.33 meters per second, you are spending more time in the total eccentric phase. But then kind of the, the period of peak eccentric stress is going to be considerably lower just because like your your bar velocity that you then have to decelerate to start your concentric is so much slower. Um, so to to me that just kind of like th there there are layers of assumptions even underpinning that. Like, you know, is the duration of stress or the total intensity of stress more important? What's what are the dose response relationships of those two variables? Like what mechanistically is going on? Are you, are you trying to reach a threshold or is it something you accumulate? Like yeah, like there there are a bunch of like additional underlying assumptions, even a step down from that, that we probably don't have time to unpack here. And even if we did, there's not research to unpack to necessarily unpack all of those underlying assumptions. But just purely just purely on kind of like a, a one level down perspective, um, faster versus slower eccentrics to me seem like it's kind of a trade off of duration of eccentric stress versus intensity of eccentric stress where the duration's obviously longer with slower eccentrics but the peak intensity of eccentric stress is higher with faster eccentrics and so to to me just kind of on a baseline level it just it just felt like that's kind of an inherent trade-off and i wouldn't have necessarily expected one to be way way better than the other um so yeah that's that's kind of that's kind of my thinking on it yeah and if if you if you even look at, because originally I wanted to have a section on the paper called contraction type and sort of unpack why like we include both the eccentric and the concentric, uh, why we include both actions when we do a repetition, and then if you it's true that I I also believe that a lot of people have sort of heard or like glazed at the literature and seen that oh eccentrics only are better than concentrics only. Um, 
and they've looked at some of the literature that has showed that. But then there's other literature, uh, like there's a review by Frankie Franchi et al. 2017, where they they uh, found that there was no major hypertrophic differences when concentric and eccentric only conditions were matched for overall workload, which was then contrasted by another study in 2018, uh, but then further contrasted by another study in 2022. So overall, it it does seem that eccentric only training can be quite potent for hypertrophy, but including both actions makes sense from a practicality standpoint. Um, but at the same time, the idea that concentrics only are as superior as sometimes presented uh, may have some stronger terms and conditions than most people um, tend to think. That makes sense to me. Um, one just kind of final fun question before we wrap up on technique and and pivot to the next topic um, is do you have do you have like any hot takes regarding exercise technique like things. Things that just like fully, you know, aren't refuted by the literature, but aren't supported by the literature. Like, like science has nothing to say about them, but just based on how something feels to you or your experiences as a coach is, is just like something you believe. Yeah, it, it would it would have to be, um, you know, related to injury mm. and the idea that uh, certain adjustments to exercise technique inherently minimize like significantly minimize the risk of injury or that slightly deviating from what we consider strict or textbook technique will really increase your risk of injury. Um, if you look at direct evidence on <laughs> exercise technique and injury, you're not going to find anything. Um, there are some studies that, for example, that have looked at human and animal cadavers and have argued for you know spinal flexion uh lumbar spine flexion and lower back pain at the same time then you look at meta-analyses on the topic and you see that there doesn't seem to be a clear relationship but my hot take is that as long as you keep things relatively consistent and things are feeling good you can do things that look pretty pretty bad and we've seen those people in the gym anecdotally. Like we all know that one guy in the gym that deadlifts with horrible textbook form, but he's still there walking and still deadlifting. So the hot take is that eh, maybe it doesn't matter as much as we think. And your you know injuries are much more random and uh, somewhat out of our control than we think. I guess that that's my hottest take. Yeah, I I agree with that. Um, I am like a a chronic low back pain person and so are you oh yeah yeah um i i still don't know exactly what happened but yeah I, like i i injured my back at 16 and it's never been right since um but yeah so so like just just for my moment to moment pain experience um yeah like how i move is is like pretty reliably related to that um but you know, th there's a there's a difference between kind of like my personal experience uh, of kind of like managing ongoing injury related symptoms, which at this point may not even be injury related. It could just kind of be like long term sensitization stuff versus risk factors for acute injuries and in currently uninjured people. Um, yeah, that that was something that did take a while for me to to wrap my head around, though, just because like my my like individual experience was like so suggestive in a particular direction. Um, but yeah, can't, can't generalize too much from that, I guess. Yeah. And that, that then goes back to, Oh, doing this hurts and doesn't feel good. Maybe don't do this, you know, like, cause I have the same with my, with my shoulder. There are certain modifications my, with my left shoulder that I need to make in order for things to feel good. But then you see people that will like heavily criticize or catastrophize over, slight deviations in exercise technique and feel like oh i am like legit risking you know being unable to walk or whatever just because my back slightly rounded on the or i didn't you know retract my shoulders uh, or whatever mm -hmm. so I would, I would urge caution there and I urge movement optimism as the 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 fellow greg lehman i'm not sure you're mm -hmm. aware right yeah yeah for sure yeah, so Greg Lehman. I am possibly the biggest promoter of Greg Lehman. I'm not sure if he knows of my existence, but I've sent more people to his videos and, and work than 
probably anybody else. But yeah, being a movement optimist is probably going to help. Milo, for example, is on the far other side of the spectrum where he like he got he hurt his back one day deadlifting, and Milo's a strong deadlifter. We're talking like six hundred or like six plates for reps on mm -hmm. the deadlift. And um, he hurt his back to the point where he was like, it was heavily affecting his ability to walk. And Milo is not the kind of guy that will mistake soreness or some like slight pain for for an injury. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And he was like, okay, I'm, uh, I'll be, I'll take my time with uh, with the loads that I lift, um, give it a few few days to a couple of weeks, and then he was back to deadlifting in no time. I know a lot of people that would have gotten. MRIs that would have gone to physios and that would they would have thought that this moment is a defining moment in my lifting career and something is horribly wrong with me and I won't be able to lift like uh, I did ever again, which can then affect getting back to lifting and pain perception and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think that that's a, a good place to wrap up our discussion of technique. We're going to pause for a quick ad break, and when we come back, we're going to shift gears and talk minimum effective dose training. So uh, if you're listening, stick around, and we will be back soon. All right, welcome back to the podcast. Uh, still here with Dr. Pack, PhD. Uh, and like I said, we're going to shift gears and talk a little bit about minimum effective dose training. You, you mentioned at the top of the episode that that was, uh, the topic of your doctoral research. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, before, before we actually dive into the, the applied aspects of the topic and the research on the topic, I'm curious, just what, what got you interested in that topic for the first, in, in the first place? Like you could... You could choose anything for your doctoral research. What uh, what specifically interested you in minimum effective dose training? Yeah, super awesome question. So when we started with uh, James, the original idea for the PhD was something along the lines of like the main factors that uh, affect or at least predict powerlifting performance. But after doing like a, trying to do a literature review on the topic, I was like, there's just way too much there um, to unpack, and I would have to focus on one uh, key area, and it didn't seem that interesting to me. At the same time, we had a very nice setup in Athens, Greece, at the Olympic weightlifting hall in the Olympic Stadium, the infamous. Um, I think there's a few solid weightlifters that have come out of that hall. Long story short... Dimas, baby. Hmm? Dimas. I said Dimas, baby. Okay. You want a fun story about Dimas's brother? I would love any fun story at all related to Piros Dimas, one of my favorite athletes of all time. Really cool guy. And his, his brother, uh, Odysseus Dimas, a.k.a. Odysseus Dimas. God, he that's is, such a sick name. Yeah, right? He is the, I think he's still the current um, weightlifting coach for the Greek powerlifting, weight, uh, weight, sorry, Greek weightlifting national team. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so that weightlifting hall was uh, essentially separated in two. Well, in one third and then two thirds. Two thirds Olympic weightlifting and then one third powerlifting in the corner of shame. Because um, weightlifters, maybe it's more in Greece, but they don't really look up to powerlifters. Uh, like it's considered as the, you know, uh, um, the wish version of, of weightlifting because it's not, you know, complex enough. Well, and you can win Olympic gold in one and not the other. That's true. That's facts. You heard it here first. Uh, not really. You've heard it before. It's a fact. But um, that's a fair point, actually. Powerlifting debunked, gone wrong. I think it should be the, the title of the, the, the podcast episode. I, I mean, as, as a powerlifter, I do think weightlifting is just objectively cooler. Because, like... It is, it is. They're still lifting such, such heavy weights. But, like, you know, I, I, think, I think almost anyone has at least some degree of personal context for a heavy deadlift, you know? Like, mm, everyone's picked sure. up something heavy off the ground. And, like, maybe the heaviest thing you've picked up is 200 pounds. You see someone lifting 800 pounds, and you're like, damn, that's way heavier than something I could lift. But, like, you still have some mental context for it. You see someone snatch 400 pounds, you're like, what the fuck is going on there? Yeah, like, that's, yeah, that's, true. that's crazy. And I mean, weightlifters are so, sh they're so strong, dude. Like, I don't know. Uh, 
I mean, obviously, obviously there is a lot of like speed and technique and it's not just like raw strength, but ju just visually, if you take uh, like a, a pretty strong middleweight bencher and they bench 405, you're like, oh, mm -hmm. damn, like you held 405 pounds in your hands, you pressed it like it's very strong. That's impressive. You see a similar size guy put it over his head in a clean and jerk. Come on. Yeah, that's like yeah, that's true. It's over your head. It's way up there. Like it's it's cooler, you know, and like it's faster. Eh. I don't know. It's, you know what's what's missing? It's the hype that I think undermines Olympic weightlifting. Cause you see like some Chinese weightlifters, the guys there like 33 kilograms in body weight squatting 250 kilos at ATG or doing some extreme snatch, and then absolute poker face, no celebration, nobody shouting, and you're like, oh, okay. Uh, if you don't know like if if the weight if the weight is not impressive to you because you you you're not really reading the bar you're just seeing some plates on a bar you're like okay the guy didn't seem that hyped about it it's probably not that extreme whereas then you see the guy deadlifting on TikTok and it's like the whole gym is around him everybody's screaming and you're like wow that was insane he managed to lock this out ah uh, yeah no I mean tra training footage sure sure um. I get Olympic that. footage, sure, okay, yeah, there's more hype. Yeah, there. I mean, dude, like inter international weightlifting competitions can can get crazy, um, and like I don't know that that could that could just be a a matter of kind of like the parts of the world where the different sports are popular. Like, I f I feel like powerlifting is like more popular in more chill countries. I guess like mm -hmm. if you compare for for instance. Um, like American basketball fans to like Balkan basketball fans. Goodbye. Oh, buddy. It's a, it's a different fucking world. Um, it's a different world indeed. And that's one of the main things I tell Americans because I've been, I've been to the stadium many times. Mm -hmm. We're talking scenes. We're talking flares on flares. We're talking things that are, shouldn't be allowed and are not, but it's, it's mad. I think at, at from certain levels of resolution, weightlifting, like the 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 most hype weightlifting competitions are more hype than the most hype powerlifting competitions, I think, by by a pretty comfortable margin. Fair enough. Fair enough. Back to the, okay, the story. Sorry, sorry. We make we make we make a we make a, a great ADHD duo here. It's been it's been amazing because you match that energy, and then I don't feel bad about the about me going off on a on a random story about Pierce as Dimas' brother. So weightlifters snobbing powerlifters to the point where there would be times where people would tell you to be quiet or stop doing what you're doing because they would do like a max attempt, the mm -hmm. weightlifters, the part. And um, Odysseus Dimas one day walks in, comes to the <laughs> to the powerlifting area on with flip-flops. There was something loaded on the bench. I think it was like 110 kilos or something. Sits down, grinds it out for a single rep, no warm-up, no nothing, but like proper grind. <laughs> Puts it back, leaves. Um, and also, official review of the... Because they had like a, an Aleko um, power bar. Mm -hmm. And he was like, hmm, it's not a good bar. It doesn't, it doesn't bend much. It doesn't have much, mm -hmm. uh, much whip. Uh, so that's, that's the, the anecdote there. The situation with the study was that we had a good friend and the coach of that powerlifting team, Panayotis Kolokotronis, also extremely uh, a well-achieved musician in Greece. Uh, actually, that's his full-time job. He's a bouzouki player. And he, we essentially had a setup, which is extremely rare for the world, let alone Greece, where we essentially had a bunch of power lifters gathered there that we could somehow in, um, control their training. So I was like, hey, how about we try and do like a pilot study or some form of study if they're up for it? And um, they were up for it. And we were like, okay, let's just try... Um, different like protocols. Let's do like a traditional powerlifting protocol in preparation for Greek nationals versus something on the extreme end, but on the extreme end as far as low volume training goes. Mm -hmm. So let's just have them do very little, like an insanely low amount of training volume. And while thinking of that uh, study, that's where the idea for the minimum effective training dose uh, sort of uh, came to life. Because I started looking at the literature and I was like, okay, what is the least one needs to do to get stronger? And as I looked, there was no direct, um, th there was no paper directly synthesizing the existing literature. There were no, obviously there were no studies on powerlifters, training studies specifically. And I was like, you know what? 
this may be the topic for the PhD. What's the least one needs to do? What's the least a power lifter needs to do to get stronger? So essentially the pilot study that ended up making it in the PhD was what gave birth to the PhD itself. Can you talk a little bit about your PhD research? Um, just kind of like what you did, what you found that combined with the other literature kind of the, the implications for what it seems like the minimum effective dose for strength development is. Sure. Um, so for everybody listening, aside from um, obviously the studies being linked below, if you just type minimum dose, one word, dot training in your browser, that will take you to a link tree that has all the studies there. So the first three studies there are essentially the entirety of my PhD. Um, uh, they've all been published there. Two of them are open access. One is not, but I'm sure you can find ways to access it. So as far as the literature review of the PhD, um, when I did the literature review back in 2018, 19, there was nothing on, on powerlifter specifically. So I looked at resistance trained individuals. There was no data on women directly. So I ended up looking at resistance trained men. And we found that performing a single set of 6 to 12 reps with loads ranging anywhere from 70 to 85% of one's one repetition maximum uh, strength, performed two to three times per week, reaching volitional or momentary failure, um, can lead to suboptimal yet significant uh, increases in both squat and bench press 1RM strength because um, there was no data on the deadlift. So that's essentially like for general sort of it was for one repetition maximum strength, but we didn't look at a, uh, a population of power lifters there. So then we performed, well, we had actually performed the pilot study um, at a similar time where we had a bunch of people perform just uh, less than a handful of singles per power lift per week. So they were doing one single per week for the deadlift, obviously including their warmups, and uh, three singles per week for the bench press and two singles per week for the squat training three times per week with a squat bench deadlift frequency of two, three, one. And this was a bit of a tricky study because they prepared and they got tested, not in a lab or the hall or the training training facility, but rather we used their hall, pre-training training hall numbers, so their, their testing session numbers, and compared them to what they achieved in, at Greek Nationals. And as many of the listeners of the podcast are aware, um, Competing and putting up numbers in a competition is a much different story than yeah. doing so in your like regular gym environment. What we did see though is that out of the the few people in the group that did just the singles, the four out of five people managed to hit, like surpass their their training total um, during training, and some um, did okay at competition, saw some increases, some decreased, and one maintained. But the fact that their peri training results, because that study was 10 weeks long, hinted at the idea that hmm, maybe you could go as low as doing a few singles per week. So then we did a bunch of studies to see whether that's true or not. And um, those were published as one paper, which you are also uh, a co-author on. Y yes. And uh, j just to uh, slightly apologize and give context for something I said. Um, it may have sounded like I was like being slightly dismissive, like, ah, don't go into too much excruciating detail here. Um, not because I, I don't want you to be able to describe your research in whatever depth you see fit, but it was because I was an author on that paper and it's a long fucking paper. It's a long paper, And, eh, uh, you know, li Ain't nobody got time for that. I mean, the listeners no, no, here, have, yeah. <laughs> the, the listeners here like long episodes, but I figure we probably shouldn't push it another two hours. Uh, so yeah, that, that is what I had in mind when, when I said that, uh, it's yeah. a very, it's, it's a very fair comment because, and I think a lot of people have missed out on the fact, I think this was one of the first, um, multi-experiment papers in sports science In psychology. It's more common to see multi-experiment papers. Mm -hmm. Shout out to James Steele. That was, that was his idea. And essentially what we did here was we did one interview study with very experienced coaches and athletes. So I'm talking about like some of the best powerlifters in the world, regardless of um, federation, sex, or age, as well as many experienced coaches with like tons of na IPF national and world champions under their belt. Um, when we essentially explored the concept of the minimum dose, we asked them, hey, have you played around with the concept? 
what do you think is, is possible as far as strength increases in, in certain periods of time? What's the least one can do? Um, we also did a couple of studies where we had people perform uh, single, just singles like we did in the pilot study. Uh, then we had a group perform singles and a couple of back offsets. Um, and we also asked nationally qualified IPF powerlifters about their experiences with minimum dose training in the form of a survey, as well as try to define what meaning what what a meaningful strength change constitutes so you were right to say that hey unpacking this would take a long time and we would because we would have to essentially review five studies but overall after we triangulate all uh, the data that we that we collected including the interview and the intervention studies we found that powerlifting athletes looking to train with a minimum effective training dose approach can do by doing uh, three to six working sets of around one to five repetitions each week with those uh, sets spread across one to three sessions per week per powerlift using loads somewhat above 80% 1 RM at an RPE of somewhere between 7.5 to 9.5 for around six to 12 weeks and expect to gain strength. If you were to go as low as the people in the pilot study and just do like literally one to three singles per week per powerlift, your chances of m making meaningful gains are quite quite lower, um, and it's likely that you won't make meaningful gains. But you could experience meaningful gains just by adding two to three back offsets at eighty percent of whatever you hit for a single repetition, anywhere around eighty percent. Uh, and expect to probably surpass what coaches and powerlifting athletes regard as meaningful. So things are looking really good for people that are pressed for time or want to, you know, um, not spend a ton of their recovery resources in their training for whatever reason. Yeah, that that makes sense. Um, the follow-up question to that, that that I've always had at least is how... Um, how generalizable through time do you think that is? You know, like these these are findings over six, six weeks. To, yeah, like six weeks. And, and you know, like I'm I'm not I'm not trying to ask you to just like hype up your research or over interpret it. Like th this is this is mostly just kind of like a vibes based question, like based on your experience <laughs> as a lifter and a coach. Um, the idea of just like a few singles plus back offsets per week. Um, how long do you think that would actually lead to like productive strength increases? Like, do you, do you think that the findings may have to some extent been an artifact of the six week training blocks? Or do you think that if, uh, if you push that out to like four months, people still would have been making gains at four months? Mm, yeah, that's an interesting question. And that was, I think one of the limitations that we didn't discuss in detail, um, on the paper, like, and it's one of the questions of one of the, the viewer, the listeners as well. Could it have just been pe peaking, you know, six weeks of very specific powerlifting training sort of acting as a peak? Um, and although, yes, that may explain the results to a certain extent. Anecdotally, um, when the research came out, a lot of people reached out and said, hey, this is really cool. I did something similar for a couple of months, uh, even, even longer than a couple of months back in the day. But... If we're to triangulate, and that's why we spoke to coaches and athletes um, and experienced coaches and athletes to see whether, you know, what we found sort of lines up with their experience. Um, and it more or less did with with uh, the 12 week figure coming out off the off the back of the interviews rather than the intervention data. So I'd say that my bet we expressed with caution and based on the literature but also my personal experience as a coach i think you could do as little as three to six working sets uh, per power lift per week spread across one to three sessions uh, for three to four months and still make make gains now there are other factors that will come in play like your experience your, um, how much muscle mass have you you've you've built technical proficiency and so on and so forth. But it's not like you will know the thing. If you're training with singles, you after like a few weeks of things not looking that great, I think it's you you'll get you'll get the heads up from your training feedback pretty quickly to know that things may need uh, a different push. But 
then the question becomes how much more do you need to add to still see progress? Because it could be that if you add another set or two, you can still just like keep going for another couple of months mm -hmm. and then, you know, same old, same old. Um, but I'd say with some certainty, three to four months should be should be more than enough for you to make meaningful strength gains based on uh, powerlifting um, uh, standards. Yeah, I, I I I agree with that. Honestly, um, I don't know. I I think I think the way someone views that will probably be so filtered through the lens of their own experience that I do question the generalizability. Like I I think that what you outlined would probably be a pretty productive long term approach to training, like beyond six weeks. Um, but that is heavily informed by the fact that that type of thing has been pretty successful for me for periods longer than six weeks. Um, and I, I imagine if that had not been the case for someone else, they'd be like, nah, you're full of shit. So yeah, but that, that, that would be, uh, that would be something I would be interested in seeing more research on in the future. Um, Same. and not just on this research topic. I mean, almost everything like, if if you can if you can get twelve weeks out of a training study, like you're doing pretty good for yourself, um, and like ah, three months just isn't that long in the context of like a ten year training career. Like with with so many topics in the research, I'm like ah, just how would it look at six months? How would it look at a year? You know, wouldn't it be nice if like we got like if I think if somebody decided like a millionaire, like a multi multi millionaire was like okay, let's answer some fundamental questions that we have about muscle building and strength. Here's a few millions. Do the studies. Don't you think like if we had that money in like a couple of years, we could answer a lot of big questions? I think we could do it now, honestly. I think that... Um, so, all right. Th one of the issues is uh, like subject recruitment and retention um, mm -hmm. and, and just purely a matter of like who's going to run the training visits. Because, like, more than people realize, science is largely done by grad students on grad students. <laughs> and so, you know, there are summers, there are, like, winter breaks. Um, for master students, they're in the program for two years. They're pretty worthless for the first semester. So there's some, like, training time to get them up to speed. So, you know, all, all of those things. And, and, like, a lot of the subjects will also just be undergrad students. So... You got like if if you start a study on the first week of classes, like you can do sixteen weeks before finals. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so the, if you wanted to do a long term training study, it would be challenging to find enough people in proximity to like a particular lab to say like, oh yeah, like I'm going to sign on for two years. Like you can do my training for two years, and then even if you could, like people's minds change and a pretty good chunk of them would probably drop out. Um, and maybe you could keep them around. And I, th I think this may to some extent be what you had in mind with like a rich person funding this, like, ah, eh, maybe, maybe you could recruit 50 subjects in a single city to handle their training for two years. If like, you're going to pay them five, 10 grand at the end of it. Um, but like, yeah, eh, th then it gets really expensive. And, I don't know how this would be in other countries. In the U.S., you you still might not be able to get that by an IRB because, like, that's true. You get in trouble for paying people too much because it could be seen as like coercive and potentially taking advantage of people who aren't as economically advantaged. So, yeah. So I, I think I think a lot of that is like kind of a non-starter. But here's here's something I I wish existed and could exist. Uh, someone would just need to do quite a bit of legwork if there was more um like cross lab collaboration on a lot of this stuff like i th i think it would be hor horrendously difficult to find enough people for enough statistical power to run a one year training study at any single lab um outside of community dwelling older adults you see some long term studies <laughs> in them but pretty much no one else um but yeah like you, you know finding 20 30 40 people yeah, like it's it's just not going to happen. But I don't think it's unlikely that multiple labs could find like one or two people, you know? And then if you had collaboration between like 20 different labs and 
the the training burden and the data collection burden for each individual lab is like exceptionally low. You know, you just have one or two people coming in three, four times a week, like with, like with all of the other data collection you're doing, like that would just be a drop in the bucket time wise. And then like, you know, on the back end, you might need to like statistically control for like lab effects because like, eh, like some labs just may across the board tend to see more robust training effects than others like there there, w- there would be some like analytical concerns like like not not hurdles that would be unclearable but uh, like your statistical approach to analyzing the data w- would need to be a, a bit more sophisticated than a typical study but uh, like i don't know i do think that would be pretty feasible um but like most of the work would be on the front end to just like build the network of scientists who would be like willing and able to collaborate on projects like that. But I think if you distribute it enough, it would be like very feasible. Yeah. And that's something we've, we've tried and we're currently trying to, to do that was again, like James's influence was, was heavy on that, like multi-site data collection. Then the issue though becomes like, if you have people who are deep into academia as their career, there's other factors that come into what studies they can run, how many people they can they can use, what they can prioritize. But I do agree that that's where the field should start moving towards and having maybe like a, a body or, I don't know, like a, an organization that sort of handle, handles multi-site data collection or something, that could, that could definitely help us a- answer more questions. Um, yeah. Just getting back to minimum effective dose stuff, two other questions I have with that, and then I think we can kind of like wrap up this segment and and answer a few questions. The first is um, anytime this question comes up, you're you're going to see people just being like, like, why should we care about this in the first place? You know, like I'm trying to maximize my gains. Like, why why am I trying to find the minimum volume to still make some gains? Um, Or they might even come in with like negative inferences. It's like, ah, like this person's just trying to like trick people into being lazy and like sell them like, like, you know, gains with no effort. Um, so I do think it's worth talking a little bit about like why people should care about this in the first place. And that, and I'm not saying that as kind of like a gotcha, like leading question. I think there's like very clear reasons that people should care about this, but yeah, like, like, why should we care what the minimum effective dose is for strength gains? Like, who might this be, like, extremely useful and relevant for? Imagine, though, if I was actually caught off guard here and, and it was a true gotcha moment and I was like, uh, um, uh, 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 I gotta go. Um, in all seriousness, um, the thing is, a, a lot of people, if not, the, not, a, not a lot, the majority of people that engage even in strength sports and strength training as a hobby... Um, have lives, have other priorities, professional, family related, and so on and so forth. It is almost impossible that you will not have periods during your life where stress is very high, um, time is of the essence, and also mood to train is not there. We love lifting, but I'm sure everyone, even the most hardcore lifters here, do go through you know those odd couple of months where excitement to lift is just not there. And Having the minimum effect, the concept of the minimum effective dose and knowing that you can always fall back to doing less and still seeing meaningful strength increases, because keep in mind, we didn't look at what's the least you need to do in order to maintain your strength or just see some slight change in the numbers. Um, Having that concept can allow you to still remain productive during periods where other times you you could could have been um, not training because you would go, ah, yes, I cannot do my 15 sets of squats this week. Um, I'm going to skip session one. Um, I missed out on session one, might as well miss session two, and so on and so forth. Whereas now, you get sort of um, a reassurance tap on the back from big minimum dose, where minimum dose comes there in the form of a person that says, hey, bro, or sis, worry not. You can still make great gains for a short period of time. And in the long term, um, those few weeks where you did less training volume are probably not going to matter that much for strength development. At the same time, I would also argue that maximizing strength and hypertrophy is a long-term game. So finding ways to stay, to adhere to lifting consistently 
is what truly allows you to maximize versus viewing progress as this sort of short term um, short term sort of concept where it's like, okay, optimal training volume is this, I will always need to be doing that. But rather, if PAC, if we have two clones of me and PAC A is always trying to optimize, which causes him to either miss out on sessions or potentially push training harder than he needs to during periods where sleep is limited or whatever, and then that ends up, you know, have, ends up with him having to deload or potentially getting injured or whatever versus pack B who is trying to maximize adaptations for the majority of time and when not possible is still trying to get the best uh, that he can under those circumstances uh, from his training. I think that pack B will have better chances at long-term maximization of uh, outcomes. Plus, um, starting having the minimum effective dose as your starting point can be a great way to build over time and just sort of see whether you actually need more um, to get stronger. Because for some people, it may be that they're doing way more than they actually need to see uh, increases that they're interested in. Yeah, I, I think I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and, and in fact, like several other like pretty common scenarios also like immediately come to mind for me. Um, it's like my... My start with coaching was in coaching like team sport athletes versus strength mm -hmm. athletes specifically. And like this is like th these types of things are huge for them because if you're an in-season basketball player or an in-season football player, like you're, you're not like you don't have the ability to train as if you're trying to maximize strength or power development. Like you are mostly just trying to maintain or you know, if you can still like gradually build throughout the season versus your rivals who maybe are like gradually getting a little weaker, like maybe team performance improves because like you get more practices under your belt, better tactics, eh, whatever. But like, like physically in a lot of sports, it's not uncommon for players to be like at their peak first week of the season and then like slowly degrade <laughs> over the course of a season. And so knowing that it doesn't take much to not even just maintain but like slightly improve performance um is is pretty clutch for a lot of athletes uh another thing that comes to mind uh even for people who are like big on the optimization train is just like you can't necessarily push super hard on everything all the time um and so like knowing minimum effective dose for you know individual lifts can help with like specialization cycles like one of one of the things that i always found with my squat and deadlift is like i couldn't push both hard at the same time like i've yeah, like when very early in my training career sure like i could pr my squat and deadlift at the same time but i i honestly can't remember a time after i was like 17 years old that i pr'd both my squat and deadlift at the end of a training cycle and so like i would just need to alternate between the two and just kind of like keep one on like a minimum effective dose or maybe even like a step below that kind of like a maintenance dose um, and just like really push the other. And so, you know, I, I don't think that's like too terribly uncommon, um, you know, put, putting other things on the back burner while not regressing to be able to like really push something else. Um, and then also like one of like the the largest population of people that engage in resistance training um, or uh, what public health bodies would call like muscle strengthening exercise aren't lifters. Um, like th this is a, uh, this is something that, ah oh man, I forget the exact numbers, but hopefully I'm not that far off. Um, something like 35% of Americans and, somewhere between like 20 to 40% of individuals in like most developed countries meet government guidelines for like muscle strengthening exercise, um, which could be lifting, could be, you know, uh, like Pilates or uh, at home, like circuit training or whatever. But like, you know, it's um, m more people are doing uh, some form of resistance exercise than I think a lot of folks realize but it's still like a minority of the population. And in surveys, when you ask the 60 to 80% of people who aren't doing that, hey, why not? Um, time constraints are cited as a really major concern. 
And so knowing that it it doesn't take that much to like even even for like trained power lifters to get stronger and make gains like I have to assume the minimum effective dose for like a completely untrained person who's done no resistance exercise at all would be even lower. So no knowing that like like if you only have 30 minutes per week to do some sort of resistance exercise that like that is still like productive and like it's going to be good for your health but it it's also for a lot of people going to be enough to actually make them stronger maybe change like maybe allow them to see some physique changes as well although strength hypertrophy like two slightly different things like but yeah just knowing that you don't have to do that much to see positive effects i think is something a lot of people don't realize and i think we would live in a somewhat healthier society if more people did realize that cuz cuz folks think they're like hey if i'm going to do some sort of like resistance exercise the only folks that i i know who do that are like Ah, like my my nephew who's like big into bodybuilding, but like he's in the gym ten hours a week. I don't have time to go to the gym ten hours a week, so just like fuck it, I'm not even gonna try. Yeah, yeah. Like I I think that this approach could, and I think maybe even should be the default approach for most people most of the time. Like not necessarily competitive powerlifters, but just like humans that exist. Yep. Um, and so I think it's I think it's like incredibly valuable on that front. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like. You SBS has covered this um, and, and in detail. So the the paper by Charlie Shailendra et al. Uh, so resistance training and mortality risk: a systematic review and meta analysis, mm -hmm. where they essentially noted that hey, any amount of resistance training can lead to can reduce all cause mortality by around fifteen percent and cardiovascular disease mortality by nineteen percent and cancer mortality by fourteen percent with maximum reduction risk reduction uh, being achieved at around 60 minutes and it's like yeah you're you're 100 percent spot on with more like the majority of people would benefit more from the concept of the minimum effective dose um than your average you know power lifter or bodybuilder who's trying to maximize gains but it's a concept that holds a lot of value for them as well and hey nobody's telling you that's all you should do forever yeah I think the final question I have on this uh, before before we we shift to Q and A is, and th and this might be more of a vibes question than a research question. Um, <laughs> vibes. But how how do you think minimum effective dose changes throughout a training career? Like, do you think that it just gradually increases as training status increases, or some some other uh, type of arrangement? Um. Based on the fact that the numbers, like as far as like weekly sets per week are somewhat similar in studies where you have, you know, untrained individuals, then resistance trained, and then you have power lifters, given that those numbers are, you know, like a handful of sets, let's say on average, a handful of sets per lift per week seems to, seem, seems to do the trick as far as meaningful gains go. I wouldn't expect and based on the interviews as well because keep in mind when you hear all-time world record holders tell you yeah i used to do a couple of sets for my squat per week and hit a pr um my sort of belief my vibes um shifted from thinking that maybe as you get more advanced you your your minimum effective dose is somewhat larger um and I think that for the majority of, of people regardless of level the starting sort of numbers are somewhat the same so now over time as you're getting used to very low training volumes i do think because like volume and strength don't have don't at least don't appear to have the same uh, relationship as hypertrophy but more will be better after a certain point um so i do feel that there comes a point where that minimum effective training dose changes and you'll have to add a bit more volume and keep in mind adding a couple of sets may not seem like much but if you look at it as a percentage increase you could be looking at you know 200 to 300 percent more volume than you were doing before if you were doing just a few sets um but yeah i'm not entirely sure as to how that changes over time i would expect that there comes a point where you plateau and you need to do more but where when that happens is something that we we still need to figure out and obviously like strength itself over time like we recently published a paper call, called 
using powerlifting athletes to determine strength adaptations across ages uh, in males and females and longitudinal growth modeling approach. This was spearheaded by Christopher Latella and myself and Milo had the chance to help out. I read that paper. I enjoyed it. Um, oh, nice. It's for and, you only. I think it's you and us that have read it at yeah, the moment. I, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, the, the, the linear log curves, I think were probably a good choice for modeling it um but the 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 implication for for ongoing gains past a certain point is is relatively grim um it's grim that's what i was going to yeah. say <laughs> like because it's like hey early like first couple of years like first year actually of powerlifting obviously keep in mind when people start powerlifting they've obviously seen a bunch of gains until they've started powerlifting. So take that with a grain of salt. Like you see 7.5 to 12% increases from baseline in terms of like total powerlifting strength in the first year. And then you're looking at not an additional 20%, but like an additional maybe 12 at most or 7.5% after 10 years. And there comes a point after your age where you're starting to see declines in strength. And that's something that I tell some clients as well, especially experienced powerlifters, where they're like, my bench has been stuck for a few years. And they they have this idea that, you know, I'm all of a sudden going to be adding 30 and 40 pounds on that bench. And unfortunately, you have to manage expectations and be like, look, if you don't do anything drastic with uh, your body weight or change something extremely um, or change something that you hadn't been doing as far as training goes, it's likely that things are just slowing down over time. So it is the name of the game. And in the context of the minimum dose, there will come a point in general where you won't be able to see great strength increase. So it may not be that the minimum dose that you had is ineffective. It may be that no matter what you do, eking out a few more kilos on your bench or squat or deadlift is going to take a long time and a lot of consistent training. Yeah, I think that that is an important point. Just like the idea that like uh, necessary training volumes um, like necessarily just like gradually increase over time. Like that is a pretty popular idea. Um, but I'm not like I, I definitely used to believe I'm I, I think I believe it less and less these days. Um, but I, I think I think where it does maybe come from is just that like it's harder to make gains period um <laughs> and so like uh i i i sort of i sort of think that like the general kind of physiological effect of a particular dose of training doesn't necessarily change over time but it just gets like more and more blunted over time and so if if you're interested in like hey how much do i need to do to be able to like reliably PR after a 12 week training cycle. I think that like that number probably for a lot of people, again, I don't think it just like increases linearly forever, but like, I do suspect that that does go up over time. Um, just cause like it just fucking doing anything. If you're untrained, if you don't PR after 12 weeks, like you pick bad parents and, and better luck in the next life. Um, you know, if you've been training for like a year, uh, like you probably need to get after it pretty good, but like shouldn't be that bad. If you've been training for like five years, um, if you're going to PR all lifts after a 12 week training cycle, like reliably, like I, I think that that requires like really pushing yourself to the limits with what you can handle just because like the, uh, if you've been training for like five or 10 years, just because kind of like your baseline rate of adaptation to any stimulus is like so much diminished, but like that doesn't necessarily mean that the amount of volume that's effective for you has dramatically changed. It's just kind of like, if you're trying to see like measurable effects on like a particular time scale, if that makes sense, where like, you know, it, it very well could be that your your volume versus strength gains curve has never changed at any point along the way. But like previously, previously, it was like you could put 10 pounds on your squat with like one X level of volume and 30 pounds on your squat with four X level of volume in 12 weeks. But now it's like, you know, you could put half a pound on your squat <laughs> 
<laughs> with with one X level of volume in 12 weeks or five pounds on your squat with five X level of volume in 12 weeks. Like you know, the, the shape of that curve hasn't fundamentally changed, but it's just like if you're trying to see like a certain amount of measurable progress, like it, it gives the appearance of things like trending up pretty quickly. And so, yeah, like I, I don't I don't know that that's what is happening, but like I wonder if it is like I, I suspect it maybe. Yeah. Only one way to find out. That is true. Let's answer some some listener questions real quick and then and then wrap this puppy up. How does that sound to you? It sounds amazing. All right. Let's start with a question from Ali Shah. Hey, Dr. Pack. Um, just wondering if we know what's the difference between maintenance volume and let's say the minimum effective dose for hypertrophy. So I appreciate the question. As far as maintenance volume for hypertrophy and minimum effective dose, the data on minimum effective dose, if we define effective as like seeing significant um, or like meaningful hypertrophy increases, obviously in the literature for hypertrophy, we may have to look at studies that have uh, defined meaningfulness as statistical significance the volume that you need to make some form of hypertrophy gains that are deemed meaningful uh, as far as the literature goes is as low as like one to three sets per muscle group per week, which which essentially allows me to feel somewhat confident in saying that you could maintain muscle mass with as little as one like intense set per muscle group per week, potentially even less. I know you guys have touched on uh, on this topic in the uh, in the past on the podcast, where like I wouldn't be surprised even if you were, even if you did like a few isometrics or something as 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 an orthodox as that versus your regular training, that you'd still be able to maintain your muscle mass to a to to a great extent. But for the for the listener that posed the question, I'd say that one to three sets per muscle group per week can be thought of as like maintenance slash like low minimum effective dose because you are like taking a bit of a chance there as far as meaningful gains go. And as as far as like a safer bet, minimum effective dose training volume for hypertrophy, I would go somewhere in the three to six sets per muscle group per week where you can feel even more confident that you are making indeed meaningful gains. Makes sense. So... Maintenance is about half of minimum effective dose, and minimum effective dose is maybe like uh, between one half to one fifth, depending on someone's like general volume tolerance. Like maybe what's theoretically optimal for like maximizing rates of progress. Yeah, and I wouldn't be I wouldn't be worried about losing gains as if you're going to the gym and you're doing something like especially if you're keeping intensity of effort high. If you're not in some crazy deficit, I think it's very difficult for you to to lose muscle mass. And I think um, MRV, not MRV, um, min- maintenance volume is somewhat overstated. Or the idea that hey, if you're not matching your previous volume, you're losing gains. I think uh, we don't have any evidence to directly support that idea. Oh, I, I think we have evidence to like pretty strongly refute it. Yes. Ah oh, man, I'm blanking on the the name of the author, but that like 20, 2011 paper, um, like the volume reduction paper where they had people doing nine sets a week and then they cut back like the, ah, oh man, I'm going to, I'm going to kick myself. I'm blanking. I'm blanking on, on the author's name. I'll, I'll find, I'll find that and put that in the show notes. Uh, but yeah, like they, they had people train for, I think it was either like I think it was 12 weeks and then they reduced their training volume for the subsequent 12 weeks. Um, and with the young adults in that study, they, um, they either reduced the volume by one third or two, one third of their original volume or one ninth of their original volume. When they reduced it to one third of their original volume, they kept making gains. So clearly you didn't have to maintain your previous volume to keep making gains. Like they, cut back still made progress and like they they maintained for like another either like 12 or 16 weeks at one ninth of their original volume so yeah yeah like 
pretty pretty indisputably i think like maintenance volume is way lower than the volume required to actually make gains yeah it's it's great because you have i've been hearing you say that for a while and it's like it's something that i try to to communicate to lifters where they get nervous like on holidays or periods of time where they're even more like they don't have equipment or whatever i'm like literally anything as long as there's some form uh, of intensity of effort just to make sure and you're covered you're not gonna suddenly start losing muscle mass yeah uh 2011 by bickle yeah that'll that'll be in the show notes the name of the study is exercise dosing to retain resistance training adaptations in young and older adults for anyone who wants to dive in uh and yeah it was it was two 16 week phases uh and the other thing to note is that the older adults in the study did uh did end up like losing muscle and strength when they reduced their volume to one ninth of what they were doing previously but like even older adults were able to maintain for 16 weeks when reducing their volume to one third of initial so yeah i mean if 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 you're currently making gains you have you have a very large cushion to cut back and still maintain what you currently have for sure all right shall i play the next question yes sir uh next question from ross to what extent could your minimum effective dose results be explained by tapering or peaking? I believe in the study, these were not all-time PRs, but pre-slash-post. Could the pre-results just be coming off the back of more fatigue and less specific work? Is there data on how the minimum effective dose protocol would perform if initiated immediately after a deload from a peaked 1RM test? Um, excellent question. And that's one of the limitations that I think we should, uh, we should have addressed more in the paper. And I think it would have been interesting if we actually noted the participants' all-time PRs because I personally knew some of the participants and they some did hit all-time PRs, some others didn't. Uh, and that was a, a really solid question in the sense that, you know, um, seeing if you were to test my deadlift today and then have me do a minimum dose sort of protocol for six weeks, I may not hit my all time best deadlift today and I may actually surpass my all time, my, surpass my pre deadlift in six weeks, but still be below my all time best. However, I would still say that although it could be explained part uh, partly due to peaking um or some form of uh, some form of fatigue dissipa dissipation um at the same time i don't see why if if those lifters were able to see strength increases in 6 weeks i don't see how you could you could uh, necessarily work around that limitation without really really factoring in all their previous training experience peaking them and then having them follow such a protocol if that makes sense um so if they're able to make meaningful strength gains in just in, in six weeks it may be that they can continue making set gains um for for a while longer if we were to extend the duration of the study if i could just add something though i i do think that is a fair critique of your study, but not a critique that is unique to your study. Because um, like that, that question could be directed to any study on trained lifters, because you're not going to get... It's, it's not going to be the case that everyone who enrolls in your study is at their all-time strongest. So that is a limitation of your research, but that's also a limitation of all of the research on trained lifters. So I don't I don't see why it would be like particularly applicable to your research more than any others. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Like to be extremely clear, like I don't think I don't think Ross was doing this, but I do think that there are a set of uh extremely valid, like evergreen, universally applicable um criticisms that one could use to question the methodological quality of almost any resistance training study that takes place. Um, and I do sometimes see a willingness, nay, even desire to level those criticisms at study results that someone either disagrees with or finds unintuitive um, without necessarily leveling those same criticisms at studies that 
they agree with or do find intuitive. And so I would I would caution against that a little bit. Like, you know, like most 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 studies don't control for subjects like all time levels of strength. Uh, not most studies. I'm not aware of a single study <laughs> that that has uh, exactly. like factored that in or like ensured that every subject recruited was at their all time strongest when they enrolled in the study. Um, or like, you know, a, another evergreen criticism is like, oh, well, maybe these results were driven by novelty, like whatever training intervention was that was used was like different enough than what people were doing before or like, like such that the actual experimental um, manipulation didn't lead to the results, but like an interaction between that manipulation and the people's prior training uh, led to the results, which, you know, is is like similar to what Ross was asking. Like the, the question of like, were people tapering and peaking does like necessarily kind of assume that their previous volumes were higher. Therefore, this was a step down in volume. So they were tapering. But yeah, like that, that is the case for like, again, like almost all studies, like very, very few of them really like robustly account for that, which like you could, you could um, just make it standard so that you have like a four to eight week run in where everyone does a, a standardized <laughs> training program before then splitting them up down two different tracks of training. But eh, it's, it's just not feasible because like, like we talked about before, you have a finite amount of time to run a study just because of how semesters work. <laughs> um, yeah, recruiting 30 people, like 32 people across three studies, that's including the pilot study, took like three three years in total, maybe slightly less, plus COVID came as well at some point. Yeah. But like that population, I'd rather have that limitation and be able to include them than have dropouts because like three dropouts make make a difference when you're only dealing with like nine people per group because you're looking at like trained power lifters. But yeah, I don't know. Kind of like long, long story short for me and... Again, to reiterate for like the third time, I don't I don't think Ross was leveling like an unfair criticism against your paper. Like I, I do think Not that this all. was like a question asked in good faith, but like that is a a type of question that I often see asked in I think bad faith. Um where where there's there there are probably like eh, I don't want to overstate it, but there's probably like half a dozen like literally evergreen critiques one could make of a study and this this was one of them. Like, were the results potentially influenced by the prior training that the subjects were doing, and therefore you can't make inferences about the actual experimental manipulation you did because it's actually driven by what they were doing beforehand, which was uncontrolled. Which, like, yeah, sure. Like, it, I I think it's entirely possible that that influenced the results you saw, but that is also something that could influence the results of every study ever done on trained lifters and. It's just kind of a, a limitation you have to accept. Yeah, and that's why that's where the interview uh, data comes in somewhat handy. Mm -hmm. Plus the the anecdotes that have been like I have not seen many. If I have seen very few people come out um, in the past couple of years when the concept of the minimum dose gained a bit more traction and say that's BS. Um, I've I've tried training with lower volumes and I've had the worst results of my life. It's been quite the opposite as far as anecdotes go and people saying, oh, you know, I've managed to hit some solid PRs uh, when I actually toned down the volume when I was super busy or whatever. But if the data is somewhat matched by what experienced coaches and athletes say, sure, some limitations and some term terms and conditions apply, but I do think that the majority of lifters would probably see a meaningful gains um, in six to 12 weeks doing very specific um, minimum dose powerlifting training. I agree. All right, moving on to the questions that came in uh, in the Facebook group and subreddit. Uh, we have two from the subreddit. Most of the questions on the Facebook group were directed to Milo for the episode that we will be recording next week. So we got two questions from the subreddit here for PAC. Uh, the first is by Killchop666. Uh, <laughs> he says, hey, PAC, when working at a minimal effective dose, does frequency matter more or less? To give a practical example, if I only have three training days and want to do the bare minimum for my legs, does it matter if I spread the movement throughout the three days or if I just hit one bigger leg day and get it over with? Yeah, so allow me to 
per se real doctors and quote the paper, Whom Should We Really Call a Doctor? by Abdul Fattah, um, where he, and I quote, says, When we are asked in a physician's or dentist's office what kind of doctor we are, we respond, the real one. Um, that aside, <laughs> actual quote, actual paper, and I wasn't aware that people would take the real doctor joke seriously. Um, I think based on the data from our studies where people did deadlift, they deadlifted once per week, um, it didn't seem that frequency made a huge, huge deal. Like they made, they made great gains for the deadlift. If not, uh, it may be, and let me just pull up the actual, the actual data as far as changes in the, the deadlift goes. If you look at the data, um, it pretty much looks the same, if not better than, um, than the squat, at least for the, the groups that did the back offsets as well, than the squat and the bench press. And the bench press was the lift that was performed with the highest frequency. So I don't think it plays that huge of a role. Keep in mind that frequency here was determined solely by my experience as a coach, where you know you usually see that the, the deadlift performed less frequently than the squad, and the squad performed less frequently than the bench. So I wanted to create sort of a, a protocol that sort of mimicked um, real life uh, conditions. So if you have just three training days and you want to do the bare minimum for your, for your legs, I don't think that it would, as long as you can get in quality volume and whatnot, and it feels great, I don't think that it matters that much if you spread the, the, the workload throughout the week versus doing one bigger leg day and getting it over with. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I do. I tend to think that frequency matters more as volumes get higher and higher. Um, and I, I, I wonder if that's more like practical than physiological. Like if you're trying to get 30 sets in for quads per week, like it's going to be rough in one session, but like spread it over three. Eh, it's still going to be rough, but like your, your set by set quality isn't going to go to shit like as much by the end of the workout. But if you're doing three sets, you're going to get three pretty good sets, whether you're doing that one set three days or all three on one day. So, eh, yeah, I, I, I agree that it's probably not that big of a deal. Uh, our final question here is by Gowans5, who says, hey, Low volume is all the hype these days, so it had me thinking. I've heard that you should only add volume when you stop making progress. My question is, would you start someone at 6 to 10 sets per week and only add volume when necessary to continue making progress? Or would you start with a moderate amount of volume and adjust up or down based on how you're feeling to try to determine at what volume you might personally make the best progress with at that point in time? The second option would require you to probably adjust intensity, frequency, or proximity to failure rather than just increasing volume when you're not seeing progress, which obviously requires more troubleshooting. So kind of a statement slash question, but uh, ba basically just asking kind of like how you would manipulate volume over time um, when it seems that someone maybe stops progressing. Kind of like what's what's your move? Yeah. So... Coaches, uh, coaches corner um, over here. Like as a coach, if it would depend on the individual's goals. So if you were a power lifter, competitive power lifter, and you were like, look, this means a lot to me. I want to make the most I, I can make out of my training. It's, uh, it's likely that we wouldn't start at the lower end of a minimum effective training uh, volume. Let's assume that all your lifts, uh, you don't have any sort of anomalous um, requirements for your lifts as far as volume goes, where you tell me, hey, Pac, historically, uh, if I do more than X amount of sets for the deadlift, my squat, uh, squat training goes to trash, as you mentioned, Greg, right? Um, so assuming that things are relatively, relatively uh, consistent or at least normal, I would start at a slightly higher training volume. So more than than the minimum effective training dose for that individual and then adjust from there onwards Dito for hypertrophy but uh, if you're somebody with more sort of you're not a competitive strength or physique athlete i would start somewhere in the middle where we will be monitoring things like session rpe and uh, estimated e1rms as well as how you're feeling and how things are looking on from a not, not just a week-to-week -week basis, but like on a month-to-month -month basis as far as strength increases go. 
And if we see that over time, you are feeling relatively fresh after each session and you're like hitting a session RPE of like two to three out of uh, the highest being seven, that's where I would be adding more training volume. The same goes for hypertrophy. And for hypertrophy, things become even more difficult to assess as far as gains go. So if we're seeing performance increase increase on a multitude of lifts and rep ranges and you seem to be fresh enough to still do more and you're trying to absolutely maximize hypertrophy there's a chance that over time we, w- we would be adding the odd set here and there but in a less drastic um, sort of uh, approach versus if you're somebody who is like really really not Uh, feeling like you're getting fatigued after workouts if you're like hey this was a piece of cake i got in and out i barely felt like i trained that's where i would potentially push volume even more but if you're somewhere in the middle and you feel that the workouts are challenging and things are progressing uh, chances are um, that we would keep volume relatively constant for quite a bit of time before we add even more sets yeah i I, I agree with that. As time goes on, I sort of think there are less, there are fewer and fewer kind of hard rules and heuristics. It's like the the first kind of setup was I've heard that you should only add volume when you stop making progress. Um, and asking like, should you only should you start at some level and only add volume when necessary? Um, I I think that like I think that that is based on a supposition a lot of people have um that i i i know where it's coming from but i think it's completely wrong um like the idea is essentially that you have some some sort of like fixed variable called volume tolerance and that uh sort of as alluded to previously in this episode the idea being that like as your volume gets higher and higher that volume tolerance uh, increases such that you you need at least the current level of volume to keep making progress. And if you were to drop back, like you would get weaker or uh, get weaker at worst or fail to make gains at best. Um, and like there, there's just plenty of like experimental evidence suggesting that's not true. Just like like the the Bickle study, for instance, like you're you're making gains you cut your volume by two thirds, you keep making gains, like maybe not quite as fast as before, but is that because your volume tolerance had gone down or just kind of like, even if you were starting from, from scratch, you would have made slower gains with one third of the the volume that you trained with previously. Like, I think it's more the latter than the former. Um, so yeah, like I, I think, I think it depends a lot on what someone's goals are and just kind of like the training variables they respond best to like in in my experience some people do just really thrive with higher volume and some folks don't like you start ramping it up and they get really fatigued really quickly and so yeah if if someone doesn't really get worn down by higher volumes and they really seem to thrive on it i wouldn't be conservative about trying to start them with like a low volume and like gradually build them up it's like hey like you you do well with higher volumes i can start you with higher volumes you know and like if we if we need to increase from there cool and also if we ever overreach like i feel pretty confident that we can we can pull back and you're not going to regress uh by by doing so because i i think that if if volume tolerance exists it it has much more to do with like your ability to recover from the volume you're doing versus physiologically needing a ton of volume to continue making progress. Like I, th- I think that those are two distinct things and I think higher volumes do improve your ability to tolerate higher volumes. I don't necessarily think that they rapidly, if at all increase the threshold of volume you need to clear to keep making gains. Like I could be totally wrong about that, but like that's, that's kind of how I feel about it. I agree. So yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily start low and build up for everyone all the time. And there are also plenty of instances, like you alluded to, Pack, where if someone stalls, my first thought wouldn't be, let's increase volume. You know, like that that's another thing where where it a lot of it just has to do with like knowing your lifter, or if you're managing your own training, knowing yourself. You know, it could it could be more a matter of like manipulating frequency it could be more a matter of like subbing lifts in and out 
could be a matter of manipulating intensity. Like there, there are plenty of, there are plenty of knobs you could turn to try to make progress again. If you fit a plateau other than just manipulating volume. So eh, that may be kind of a cop-out answer, but it, I do think it is like quite context dependent, but I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not afraid to start someone with like moderate to high volume uh, for a certain training block. If I know that they do pretty well with moderate to high volume. Yeah, same. Totally, totally agree. And you shouldn't be that fearful of uh, fatigue building. Like I saw that comment um, somewhere else where it's like, hey, what what if I cross in the red zone where I'm in my maximum recoverable volume? Like you will know when you're overdoing it. And the the only thing you need to do is take a couple of steps back and that's it. You're not going to randomly find yourself overtraining and in at hospital just because you did a bit more than you could recover from. Worst case scenario, you'll be a bit more sore and you'll have to readjust your training in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I also think a, a conceptual model that has done a great disservice to a lot of people who, who do kind of like get into the theory of this stuff is, is the idea that, um, the relationship between volume and hypertrophy has like an inverted U relationship. I think people interpret that like too literally. Like I, yeah. like I do, I do think that it is, I think that it's a nonlinear relationship uh, that, you know, it, it does have like a downward facing shape. Like it has like a downward inflection. Um, but I don't think it, it's particularly close to U shape. And I think uh, like not like I, I don't want to sound like I'm throwing people who use that term under the bus. Cause like, I suspect a lot of the like educators that use that term are using it kind of loosely where it's not like strictly parabolic, you know, it, it's just a, it just signifies the general idea of like, Hey, you're not going to make maximal gains with like super low volume gains usually increases volume increases. And then, you keep going up, eventually it peters out and, and it might go negative at some point. But I, I think that that rightward tail is a pretty long tail. Um, and so, yeah, like I, I think I think people often get the idea that with kind of like a strict literal interpretation of that inverted U relationship, they think that like, oh, man, like I'm training like I, f I feel like I'm training pretty hard, but I'm not currently making progress. Therefore, I'm currently like teetering right on uh the the rightward uh x-intercept of that graph yeah um, and so like if if i push it a little more like i'm gonna overtrain and like start regressing um and like i i think i think in effect there's probably a pretty fucking hefty dead zone there where if you went back 10 percent or if you increased by like another 40 percent like you're fine. It's probably just not it's it's probably just not going to do anything. Like like to get to get to the point where that curve actually goes negative and you're meaningfully losing muscle and strength at like a relatively cognizable rate, like a pretty fast speed on like you know, numbers are going down on like measurable time scales and not just like in an acute fatigue way, but kind of like in a durable way where even after you deload, performance is going to be down like 20, 30 pounds like like you, I I really think you have to fucking try to get there. Like if you have to actively fight, you have to wake up every day and be like, okay, ibuprofen, cold shower, uh, like ice baths, uh, and like caffeinate yourself to the to the to the the bone, and just like force yourself to 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 do these workouts. Like you, yeah, I I I just I just don't think you're getting there by accident. <laughs> and the literature, like. Once you look at the volume literature closely and you're like, wait a second, there's, there, are, there is, you know, the evidence is mounting for 30, 30 plus sets per muscle group per week where you're still seeing growth. Even in the infamous 52 set study that you're going to touch on in detail with, with Milo probably, it's like those guys did an average of 37 sets for their quads per week and they kept seeing growth. They didn't plateau. They saw more growth than the other groups. There's a there's a cool meta in the works by the uh, Robinson et al. AKA the guys over at Data Driven Strength that will be coming out um, at some point in the future, in the near future, on training volume. I won't spoil the results because they they're not fully done with their analysis yet. But I'm 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 we may see that you know more is more and uh, up to 
an extent that people haven't really considered before. Yeah. Hot takes for the few that are still here with us. That doesn't surprise me to hear. Um, I I am going to ask you about that more when we get done recording. Th- this this is just me becoming like curmudgeonly again, I guess. But like uh, a consistent point of frustration for me is just like how much how much it seems like discourse is driven by like extremely rough conceptual models. Yeah. Um, and you can say like, Hey, well there's, there's data that says this and they're like, well, but that this, this model disagrees with that outcome. It's like, well, in science, going back to the idea of like scientific epistemology, like usually you build theories with recourse to the data. And if, new data is published that disagrees with a theory like obviously not just like one study you don't want to like throw the baby out with the with the bathwater. like i I don't want to i don't want to make it sound like i'm a naive paparian but like the idea of falsification has to be relevant at some point like if if the theory like if the data conform to the theory it's probably a pretty good theory if enough data don't conform to a theory the problem the problem is with the theory not the data um Like an insulin model of uh, obesity, for example. Yeah. Re- responding to data with saying, well, it doesn't disagree with the theory. That's that's not a refutation of the data. Like you you don't realize it, but you're refuting the theory that you're trying to argue in favor of. Preach. That's a good place to wrap it up. Nice, nice low note to end on. I'm good at that. Uh Pack, do you have uh, do you have any any final thoughts or last words for the good people listening? Not really. I thoroughly enjoyed that. If you guys have any questions um, regarding anything we talked about, feel free to reach out um, via the DMs on Instagram or I guess Twitter or formerly uh, known as Twitter, so now known as X. Um, but yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for coming on. Uh, and and where can uh. Where can the people reach you and or do you have anything that you would like to plug on the way out the door? So I do have a YouTube channel. Uh, if you type pack on YouTube, that should pop up. People can reach me on Instagram. I am not on Facebook. So again, same thing. Dr. Pack on Instagram, dr double underscore pack because the other iterations were not available. And if you want some free minimum dose uh, templates, you can go to minimumdosetraining.com. Yes, I have purchased multiple minimum dose domain names. And for the literature, minimumdose.training. Um, yeah, that's it. Sounds great. Thanks, Pac. Have a good one. Thank you. All right. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Stronger by Science podcast. Uh, we we deeply appreciate all of you. And we're, we're very excited to be back on our normal posting schedule. Uh, As mentioned multiple times in this episode, uh, we will have another episode of the pod coming out in two weeks, that one with uh, Dr. Milo Wolf. So hope you enjoyed this one and uh, hope we will see slash uh, have, have another parasocial interaction with you again for the next one as well. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.